Populism, um, hosted by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research in association with the National Institute of Economic Review. It's my great pleasure to welcome you all uh, in a hybrid format, those here in the room, uh, and I will introduce our distinguished speakers in just a minute, but also all of you who've joined us uh, online. Uh, my name is Adrian Paps, I'm Deputy Director of the National Institute, uh, and as I said, it gives me really great pleasure to welcome you, together with my colleague, Sandra Busha from the University of Glasgow. We are co-organising this workshop uh, and then co-editing a special issue about which we'll no doubt say more a bit later. I will do a very, very brief uh, introduction and over to Sayantan and then we'll get started. Many, uh, you know, for many years now, you know, we've heard that we live in an age of populism and that populism is perhaps one of the greatest threats. Uh, but of course the question arises just how new this phenomenon really is. We've had populism going back at least to the 19th century, if not longer. Some people might say in ancient Rome, we had various populist figures already, not least Caesar. But what is new about this populism of our age? Is it simply a threat to liberal democracy, to market economies, and to our social order? Or is it also a correction of certain excesses that have happened? Perhaps even an opportunity to rebuild different models that are more economic, more, more, you know, leading to more prosperity, more democracy. Uh, so is it simply a threat of opportunity? What are the drivers? There are many more questions that we will uh, address today. Uh, let me uh, hand over to Sandton for a few words, and then we'll uh, get started with the first speaker, John Collins. Sandton, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Adrian. So welcome to uh, all of you, uh, in particular, all the speakers and all the participants. Um, thank you very much for making it this morning. As uh, Adrian has already said, uh, this uh, is linked to a special issue of the National Institute of Economic Review. Um, uh, so, you know, the speakers here, the distinguished speakers here today are going to address various aspects of populism uh, and as well as policy responses, potential policy responses to populism. And um, I look forward to uh, listening to all the speakers as well as making, uh, as well as giving my own talk later on in the program. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sayantan. It's been uh, a great collaboration. And uh, as, you, as you say, we really look forward to all the papers on both analyzing the problem and thinking about policy uh, responses. Can I just say uh, briefly uh, that in addition to uh, all the papers you've already uh, seen on the program, uh, we've had um, uh, an addition. So the program is now until 1.30, but at least we'll get all the papers done by one. And if you can stay for the discussion until 1.30, that would be wonderful. Um, we look forward to hosting you all in person at the National Institute when the special issue is published next year. Uh, and uh, very much hope you can uh, join us in person at that point. Um, the other thing I should say is our first speaker, John Crudders, um, who I'll introduce in just a minute, um, unfortunately has to leave uh, sometime uh, this morning because he is going to uh, give a eulogy at a funeral and therefore um, can't stay with us until the end. But um, I'm really, really pleased to welcome John. John is the uh, Labour Member of Parliament for Dagenham and Rain. Um, and uh, has not only a PhD in industrial relations from Warwick, so he's in very good uh, company with Marcus and other colleagues in the Warwick uh, Association, but also um, been one of the uh, main uh, intellectual forces in Parliament for many years, and recently written uh, The Dignity of Labour, published earlier this year by Polity. Um, and John is going to talk to us about diagnosing left-wing and right-wing populism. So John, over to you and thanks again very much for joining us. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, it's very good to be with you this morning. Um, and thank you very much for the invite. In my brief remarks, I briefly want to touch on modern populism from the both the left and right, as Adrian said, um, with primary focus on some of the political dynamics of work and how we diagnose it, and with reference to questions in the labour market as well. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity opportunity to do this as politicians, strangely, we spend very little time discussing the threats to liberal democracy itself. We spend a lot of time in the weeds of policy and political tactics. Consequently, it appears that some of these questions almost appear too big for domestic 
politics to deal with. So they are kept out of range in terms of political conversation. Um, and basically, I want to do two things. First, start with an argument developed in 2018 by Michael Sandel, which he returns to in his most recent book, The Tyranny of Merit, which I think is a really useful jumping off point. Not least is it's currently being used and applied in the current German elections by SPD frontrunner Olaf Scholz in his diagnosis of the challenges facing this country. So it's quite a, an applied political science that we're talking about here with a real contemporary relevance, I think. And second, I want to shine a light on some of the more significant debates in and around the left and Labour. One that is about rejecting or accepting a new economic populism based around age and assets. So, um, to begin with, I think Sandel offers us an elegant answer to what is fueling the authoritarian popular upheavals that are disfiguring liberal democracies across the planet. And he lays the blame on social democracy itself. For Sandel, progressive politics, social democracy must rediscover its essential moral purpose, visible in the post-war attempts to regulate capital in the market and build the welfare state. In short, it is not just a question of material justice, nothing less than the need to build a new public philosophy for politics itself. In the face of escalating authoritarianism, Sandel suggests an economy of outrage so that energy is channeled into the creation of a rigorous political response. And hopefully this debate today is part of that response. Such a response would be one that moves beyond quite understandable forms of protest and resistance. And this demands an awareness of the forces driving today's almost bewildering political changes and turbulence. So we start with how progressive politics long ago lost its ethical grip and collapsed into forms of technocratic administration. And today's populist uprisings for Claire Sandel reflect a backlash against this soulless managerialism. They offer an angry verdict on a long-term liberal compact with capital that has entrenched economic and democratic inequalities and rolled back genuine social mobility. The centre-left politicians that succeeded Thatcher and Reagan, like Blair, Clinton, Schroeder, essentially left unchallenged the market orthodoxies that preceded them. Obama, once in office, to come to the same forces at the expense of the moral clarity he expressed when running as candidate. So rethinking the purpose of progressive politics needs to go way beyond acknowledging economic grievous and enduring inequality. It requires a very different conversation, <laughs> one that addresses moral and cultural questions regarding the lives we wish to live and how the current disparity between that ideal and reality can find painful and often angry expression through resentment grievance and humiliation. This will be tough for three obvious reasons. Firstly, flat growth, austerity, enduring wage crash has produced indentured insecurity and anxiety for future generations. Growth is not inclusive, social mobility is in reverse, and patterns of inequality are intensified. Second time, so secondly, at the same time, the social contract has to be rebuilt given the fast pace of demographic change which has heightened tensions over inclusivity in modern societies where contributory social insurance schemes form the basis of national solidarities. The essential insider-outsider dilemma is that we get the social democratic interest. Thirdly, the nature of the publication, public conversation is also undergoing a dramatic transformation. Social media has exacerbated the acrimony generated by these discussions, the echo chambers produced, and amplified more radical and not necessarily benign ideas that have been propelled into the mainstream by democracies. So, in short, Sandow suggests four themes for progressive politics to grapple with in order to begin to respond to these profound challenges. First, income inequality. What is a modern form of inclusive growth? Progressive politics has grown accustomed to a language of supply side reform and equality of opportunity to combat inequality. This rings hollow when seen alongside modern inequalities of power and wealth, which cannot over be overcome by the mantra of mobility. Second, a meritocratic hubris. The second theme flows from the language of opportunity and removing barriers to success. Meritocracy has further entrenched the deep privilege. Sandel urges us to challenge the harsh judgments that liberals and progressives impose on those who are viewed as unsuccessful in the terms of this meritocratic society, not least due to the resentment this builds in turn fueling this populist backlash. It adds to a sense of cultural detachment in politics and a disrespect for the work performed by many 
fellow citizens and their achievements. Thirdly, the dignity of work itself. What, will, work, what role will work play in the future and the lives we wish to live? For Tony Blair and New Labour, the knowledge economy signaled the end of the post-war economy and traditional labour itself. The working class was on the wrong side of history. Knowledge work was the future. The famous slogan of education, education, education captured an economic policy that was focused on human capital. This false nirvana is being re resurrected today by a utopian post-work politics that embraces <coughs> universal basic income and can suggest a disdain for jobs not considered worthwhile within that metric. At a minimum, the data in support of the end of work through AI, automation, and distributed production can be disputed. At worst, this agenda can reinforce a detachment of progressive politics and thinking and help build the forces driving these authoritarian impulses. We need a more thorough discussion around the future of work, and we're in the foothills of such a discussion. And fourthly, questions of patriotism and the national community. The biggest challenge provided by Sandel argument concerns the moral significance of national boundaries. Progressive thinking has tended to embrace a cosmopolitanism that asserts a privileged global citizenship over other forms of solidarity, attachment and fidelity. Yet politicians seek a mandate from a specific piece of territory, a constituency or a nation. Does the progressive politician have a set of moral obligations to that particular electorate over and above an imagined global responsibility? The rise of the populist right is inseparable from the politics of English identity. And this is not a question of political expediency or of pandering to the populist right. Politicians in difficult times have a duty to explain how they hope to rebuild stable communities, ones that share sacrifice, risk and reward in a difficult world. So far, the most difficult task for progressive thinking has to be just to challenge the story of dispossession and abandonment offered by the populist right and to offer a positive, optimistic reimagination of nationhood itself. So I think this is a very good frame to discuss populism, causes, consequences, possible solutions. Sandel's argument is subtle, but contains within it profound philosophical questions <laughs> which we cannot avoid indefinitely. On the one hand, he suggests progressive thinking has been concerned with allocating the sources and material justice, consequently too technocratic and blinkered in terms of understanding the lives people wish to live. On the other, he suggests we recoil from moral questions because of our insistence on liberal neutrality and in so doing we disengage from the fundamental issues that feed the populist right, questions of worth, esteem, resentment, humiliation. So we're using a language of rights, opportunity and fairness that, quote, flatten questions of meaning, identity and purpose. Now, my second point refers to modern politics and populism, just using that Sandel frame as a jumping off point, as I say. Clearly on display this week, um, the Tories are trying to deploy a populist friend enemy rift, uh, the hallmark of classical populism, if you want around Europe, around questions of around migration, around liberal elites, around woke culture, identity politics, um, around the humanities actually, at the universities. Um, meanwhile, friends of mine that I took to on the right of politics see this year, this moment as commensurate with 1979, where a reconstitution of class forces and coalitions, a new red wall conservatism, in a sort of political shorthand. You see it with big state, big taxes, just this week. The renewed party of the NHS, and infrastructure, a blue collar conservatism, an embrace of working class conservatism, a radical reset of what conservatism is. Um, but if Sandel is right in terms of the dignity of labor, can Johnson and his government fully reject the legacy of Thatcherism in terms of labor market deregulation or more fraud? So not just in terms of tax, but a more general question of making work pay and building jobs you can raise your family on, to quote Joe Biden. And I doubt it, although the jury is out, and they certainly are showing a creativity and a uh, political dexterity um, just over the last few days. Um, today, however, 
marks the first day, I think, in almost 140 polls that the Conservative Party are behind, just a few days after this extraordinary announcement of social care tax. Um, there appears to be a brittleness within the party, a possible backlash from the right that would question this uh, moves into a big state, a big tax embrace of public services. Um, will they be able to do what Sandel requests? Will the classical liberal Tories accept this reset on the right? Um, there wasn't a rebellion this week, despite these extraordinary changes, but we will see what happens as the um, political agenda develops mm -hmm. over the next weeks and months. Now, to flip this over in terms of the left of politics, Sandel's analysis might offer opportunities for Labour. Obviously, Labour's problem is a disconnect with large parts of the electorate. It's deep, complex and long-standing. The next few years, we'll see a major fault line developed on the left, which is pretty well... Um, there is a lack of discussion around this, but this, I think, will emerge as the um, primary fault line within left politics. You can see two contrasting, contrasting approaches to the rise of the populist right. Who wins this emerging bad battle will shape the future and indeed the existence of the Labour Party, to my view. The first is based on the assumption of a new political cleavage around assets and age across society and politics. And the second, epitomised by Labour's recently announced New Deal for Working People agenda, suggests a new politics of work to reunite classes, geographies and ages, less populist, more inclusive. And so the first argument around assets and age suggests a new dispossessed and a new populist politics to represent this dispossession. An increasingly popular option being canvassed, often by the post-Corbynist left, assumes the emergence of a new political cleavage primarily based on asset ownership and age. The argument goes something like this. Firstly, modern capitalism has for at least the last quarter century operated on a predominantly financialized basis. Even non-financial corporations increasingly make their money from developing and disposing of assets and accrual of rent from monopolization of access to assets rather than long-term investment in human and physical capital. Here, rentierism is seen as the cause of productive malaise rather than its outcome. A new dispossessed has emerged consistent largely of younger, insecure, asset poor, gig economy and service sector workers in the labour market and renters in the housing market. Locked out of access to assets, security and mobility, this becomes a generation rent. A generational divide requires the construction of an opposite category, a fen enemy distinction foundation to populist politics. So here, the elite are seen as asset rich, comfortable and conservative, owing to home ownership, occupational pensions, and others advantages they enjoy. Security and housing and jobs is now considered charismatic, characteristic of parts of the traditional working class. Here, focusing on so-called red wall voters, won't work as they are disproportionately beneficiaries of asset-based cleavages, notably home ownership, which render many immune to the electoral alternatives to conservatism. There is also prevailing subtext that older voters are nativist and unreachable culturally on issues of race and class. Here, for the populist left, the new core of a potential Labour coalition is this generation rent. Urban, cosmopolitan, degree educated, locked out of, locked in precarious, insecure, badly paid jobs and low quality, high cost rented housing. The common fate of such as Paul Mason, events have brought a new proletariat into being for whom the primary focus of exploitation, injustice, and thus identity, and the, the new terrain of class struggle do not revolve around work, but rather human rights, equality, climate change, transgender issues, national self-determination, male violence, and Black Lives Matter, I quote. This then forms a new populism around identity, assets, and age. Crucially, compared to the diagnosis supplied by Sandel, here work no longer has relevance as a source of meaning or political identity, replaced by age and assets as a new arbiter of new political coalitions of the future. Now, the alternative in and around the left is searching towards a new politics of work more consistent with the diagnosis supplied by Sandel, extending rights, strengthening trade unions, expanding collective bargaining, developing the industrial strategy, 
bolstering manufacturing, investing in skills, apprenticeships, training, reimagining a national economy once again. These proposals establish a clear dividing line with the Conservatives, arguably who cannot go the extra mile in terms of labour market regulation, as I mentioned, despite their record objectives and have shown a reluctance. For example, they've shown a remarkable reluctance to implement the kind of labour market and labour employment reform signal by the ultimately inadequate tailor of your modern working practices commissioned under Theresa May. So this emerging position we saw in this week's criticisms of the so-called jobs tax, they do need strengthening, but it is one to watch. And the most obvious route forward on this front would be legislation on corporate governance that strengthens work of worker and stakeholder voice, modifies reporting and other mechanisms so as to counter the influence of stakeholder value. A modern form of stakeholder economics, if you like. Um, and it also plays into an emerging federalism across the centre-left. You can see signs of it, the good work activities of Sadiq Khan in London and Vernon in Greater Manchester, as well as the emerging agenda of other mayoral, mayoral agendas. So the conclusions I just want to point to are the varieties of left and right populism, the friend-enemy distinction both on the right populism and left populism, it's early days in terms of how these positions will consolidate in terms of the domestic political parties. Um, the Sandel grid is a useful one of linking political economy questions with questions of worth, meaning, esteem that are driving modern discontent and anger. The point that the clock is ticking in terms of the stability of our liberal democracies. Um, and the question of how this is played out, not just in terms of the questions of the electoral arithmetic in Westminster, but arguably this does sound somewhat melodramatic, the very stability of our liberal democracies themselves. So the stakes are pretty high, and that's why I welcome this conversation today. I wish I could be with you all morning. Every morning. I have a, a funeral I'm afraid I have to go to, but I really um, appreciate the invitation and look forward to discussions in the following. Thank you. John, thank you so much uh, for that uh, presentation. That was a real um, wonderful start for our workshop this morning. Um, shall we take just a few minutes of uh, questions um, and then we'll move on with only ever so slightly behind the schedule. Well, we've got a tea and coffee break, which we might have to shorten just a bit uh, to catch up on the initial day. Uh, Santan, would you like to yes. start us off with a question? So I had a question for, uh, for John. Um, I just wanted to ask him whether the the point that he made about left wing populism, the markers of identity, climate change, etc., can these be viewed as essentially the expression of a of a new elite rather than so it may it may speak the language of left wing populism, but could we is it better viewed as um, you know, the cultural expression of a new, primarily urban-based um, elite, um, um, you know, so, and in a sense, the option that he identified is, is, a, is sort of more uh, traditional ideas around coalition building, um, et cetera. So, it, so the choice may not be so much about left-wing or right-wing populism, it, you know, what he's talking about as left-wing populism is really the expression of an of a cultural expression of a new elite or a section of the elite. I'm sort of, uh, I'm giving away my position in these discussions here. We are very much agree with the uh, sentiment behind the question. I do see it very much as a new form, almost a generational egotism on the left as well, which is driving a new elitist politics amongst those who are the beneficiaries of liberal democracy itself in terms of patterns of uh, education improvement, etc. Um, but what you're seeing is a major ideological offensive around the traditions that are, and the uh, conceptions of justice that dominated centre-left politics from the inception of the Labour Party over 100 years ago. So this is a profoundly significant debate which is under-discussed in terms of Westminster and beyond and amongst the commentaries. It's hugely, <clears throat> hugely important. And the demographics of the Labour Party membership, where it is 
located, its age profile feed into, and its class composition all feed into the power of these arguments within the internal architecture of the party itself. So you can take from that, I'm not over optimistic in being able to, this not becoming, emerging as the dominant approach across major sections of the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Santan. Questions or comments from uh, Ben and Nick, and then we'll probably move on, but please, Ben. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, I like the uh, way you um, set out this very sort of uh, sweeping vision of the current situation and where, where it might lead. Um, the thing that came to mind as I heard you talking was a sort of uh, building block that we have in, in sort of in economic policy, which is the idea of the median voter, that the left and right have traditionally competed for these sort of spectrums of the electorate. And the traditional force was towards the middle, where you ended up with Major and, and Blair sort of fighting it out. And what we all have known uh, for a very long time is that as soon as you um, compete over things other than tax or one policy instrument, the median voter theorem breaks down and things just fragment. And so, you know, that, as you were saying about identity politics, as uh, about um, uh, worrying about the environment, we saw, you know, we, we, that, that on its own would be enough to disrupt this sort of conventional political logic. And the other thing that I think is, that, that I sort of would expect, would have expected you to talk more about, but you didn't talk at all about, was um, immigration. I mean, you know, in a sense, my reading, having grown up in London and uh, sort of pro traditional Labour voting family, but a sense of, of big questions in our household growing up, and my dad being an immigrant, was, you know, where does Labour stand? Where did Labour stand? And where does it now stand? And where will it stand on the question of immigration? Because I think a lot of the traditional working class who um, felt that Labour was looking after them traditionally, felt abandoned by a sort of metropolitan Labour elite who really just, whose agenda shifted towards immigrants. And, you know, is that, I heard a lot of kind of putting the genie back in the bottle kind of talk coming from, and you summarising from Sandel, but is that even something that's possible? Sort of re-establishing re the unions. Well, this is this is the this is the question, really. I mean, what is achievable? There is one argument, and that would be um, gradually, almost without debate, the Labour Party and its diagnosis analysis, its membership has changed so significantly that it's irretrievable from what you would imagine uh, the Labour Party might be as a sort of evolutionary Labour Party has been such a rupture, a change that you cannot, so the waters won't come cover over again very easily in terms of the, the effects of Corbynism actually, but also the, the crises that's convulsed social democracy across Western world economies. Um, and that's why I see the debate as essentially one between a new forms of pluralism, coalition building, um, issues of interest, brokerage, and a cross-class politics that can be fought, possibly, and this more populist generational challenges. And on the and, and it, the rubber hits the road on all the big clutch political issues. So on immigration, we went into the last election with essentially a no borders policy um, because of the hyper cosmopolitanism that is that is the consequence of this generational movement and political movement within the ranks of Labour. Now, can you re-establish the notion of the national community, a new social contract? Can you confront the inside or outside of dilemmas in terms of managed migration? Um, can the party erect a policy around that? You can see almost on every issue at the moment, Labour sort of trying to manage the different elements within, which partly accounts for a lack of voice in terms of the country. Now, maybe that's necessary given what we've gone through 
Starmer thinks in the context of the pandemic, he has to hold the line, try and manage the different elements. And um, as we hit dry land in terms of coming out of the pandemic, we'll see more definition. There's a lot of emphasis being placed on his leadership so he's in the conference in a few weeks' time. He talks about primary colours and begin to shape and define what they were in the future. We shall see uh, issues of immigration, issues of taxation, issues of um, the labour market reforms. All of these things will become illustrative of those deeper contests in terms of the character of the left politics and labour itself. So they're not possible to answer these things at the moment, but it's worth trying to understand the different elements that are circling around some of these discussions. Thank you very much, Ben, John, Nick. Thanks very much, and thanks, John. That was a really, really fascinating um, talk you gave there. Um, and actually, the question I have builds on that discussion about labour politics and about this fault line on the left between new political cleavage around assets and age on the one hand and the new politics of work on the other. And I guess what I'd like to ask is whether they're actually that distinct, because the logical implication of the new politics of work, the way you were describing it, a kind of reunionization or some kind of effective substitute for what the unions did, uh, would be a shifting of national income away from capital towards labour, um, which would be the same thing as uh, reducing return on assets. And so actually, you're bridging that gap by that politics of work. Um, and that's an opportunity for the left in a certain sense, because it means that actually that divide may not be that great, um, but it's also a disadvantage, because if you're hoping to get this politics of work without getting the Daily Mail criticising you for uh, effectively attacking rents, uh, then, then that, will be, that will be more of a struggle. Yeah, just add one, I, I think that is possible actually, uh, to try and forge a coalition between the two elements if there's a there's a lot of factional hangover from the Corbyn years that would have to be resolved, um, which has disfigured the internal politics of the Labour Party, which makes it more difficult. However, I, I think you're right, but there's one element to the, the new assets and age uh, movement in around Labour is its earlier iteration was around what we used to be described as the post-work left. The, the assumption that the robots are coming, that work is dematerializing, we have to embrace automation, uh, basic income, the end of work, post-capitalism, luxury communism, there's a whole sort of narrative there which, which makes it quite a challenging proposition to rebuild a politics of work that could broker those two elements. So just sort of layering on the difficulties of the future of the party, it is possible if the political will is there on all sides to forward something. Um, a polling might be functional in putting a bit of glue back in. Um, and the idea of um, the possibility of power creates sort of new elements within that maybe creates more leverage for the media to broker such a policy. But there's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of subtext for a lot of this in terms of how you analyze work. You know, a lot of the new, younger diagnosis of the future of work suggests there's no such thing as being required work, so we should seek to abolish it. It's almost like the old Andre Gortz argument, the, the end of work, the end of death, saying farewell to the working class. So these are big clutch calls for the future, especially for a political party named the Labour Party, because the clue is in the movement. So we shall see. Great, thank you so much. I have a very, very brief question. I know we're slightly running over time, but just as another fold line, which I think you've touched on, uh, I'd just like to hear a couple of thoughts from you, John, is, so, you know, back in the New Labour days, it was all about globalisation, how inevitable that was. Now the discourse has shifted towards technology, technology drives everything, and, you know, that plays into work and, and, and other questions. But isn't there really at the heart of that thinking uh, a sort of accelerationism? We need to accelerate capitalism to really ultimately make it work for everyone. It's not working for everyone, we'll recognise that, but in order to make it work, we need accelerationism, which is shared not just by some of the, say, New Labour or Blairite positions, but also by parts of the radical left, and oddly also parts by the libertarian, parts of the libertarian right. So that actually acceleration is another fault line of this, isn't it? And of course, there's a sort of darker sort of subtext to accelerationism and everything that kind of stands behind in terms of you know what makes us human and the foundations of politics and economy and, and, and society. 
if you look at some of the most um, fashionable literatures, both on the populist left and right, there is a consistent theme about accelerating technological change and creating crisis and rupture within capitalism. Um, it's driven by forms of utopian thinking, which is a sort of response to the crisis and malaise. Um, it's, it's, there are consistencies across left and right around this notion of except they're, they're forms of demo, demographic and technological determinism characteristic of male populism on both the left and right, which we need to analyze because they create little room for politics as we know it, right? and they embrace certain um, forms of extremism, almost cultish elements, which for years would have been deemed um, outside of mainstream political debate, but gradually you've seen them mainline into uh, movements across what we would seem to be the more mainstream elements across the left and right. As the centre is empty, that vacuum is being repopulated by more pernicious forces. And that's why it's good that, that it's being discussed because we spend so little time diagnosing and acknowledging some of these forces that are uh, entering the political spaces. Right, thanks again very, very much, John, for your talk. And we now move on seamlessly to the next uh, presentation. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome uh, two colleagues uh, who are going to uh, talk about um, populism as the Achilles heel of social democracy. Um, a warm welcome to Marcus Miller, who's Emeritus Professor in the Department of Economics uh, and Research Associate at the ESSB Center for Competitive Advantage in the Global Economy um, at the University of Warwick. And Ben Sizimos, who's Associate Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics at the University of Exeter and founding director of the Instead Network. Marcus and Ben, warm welcome, and over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, are we all right? Uh, are, you, are you happy seeing us on the in the in the uh, inset there, or should Marcus turn this uh, camera on? I think with the inset that should work. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's hear whether there's any issue. But why don't you? Receive like this. Okay, and great. That should be fine with the sound as well. Are we completely audible? Uh, I think so. Yes, I think there hasn't, hasn't been any indication. But let me uh, let me double check with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. They're not there. Sorry, can you hear us on that desert island? Uh, yes, all good. Thank you very much, Marcus. Yeah, I can hear you too, Marcus. That's fine. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to present this paper joined with. Um, then, this is uh, we begin with this French saying, reculer pour mieux avancer, which suggests that you should draw back in order to go forwards. The question we face in writing this paper is how far back should you go? To Thomas Hobbes, to Locke, to Descartes? Well, we decided to go back just as far as Ken Binmore's book on natural justice in 2005, and a book by Darren Asimov and James Robinson called The Narrow Corridor, published quite recently in 2019. And our idea in this talk is to blend these two contributions together and provide a framework, um, I guess an alternative to the Sandel framework, which you've just heard about, for looking at political developments like populism. And uh, what we see is Asimov and Robinson giving us a, a long historical framework, and Kevin Binmore, who's actually present in the audience to make sure we don't get him wrong, um, providing some game theoretical rigor. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll turn to Ken's recent speculation, which is that social media <clears throat> may be the Achilles heel of social contracts, and also to the challenge posed at a global level by what's been referred to as the digital dictatorship in China. We begin, however, with something probably more familiar, which is the distinction that Isaiah Berlin made uh, between two kinds of freedom, uh, freedom from uh, forces that interfere with your life, unwarranted interference by other people, 
and the freedom to do what you want. That was a distinction he made when he was first made uh, professor of uh, political philosophy in Oxford. And I think it's useful in this context. And I think the diagram for which Asimov and Robertson have become famous, it, in fact, it's what gives the book its title, uh, brings out this distinction. So if you look at this the screen, you'll see the diagram uh, I'm referring to, which has the power of the, of the state on the vertical axis, the power of society on the horizontal axis, and the 45 degree line is when these powers are in balance. And along that 45 degree line is what Asimov and Robinson refer to as a narrow corridor where they think that societies can make progress because there's this balance between what people can do and what the state can do. You have citizens' rights, human rights, and you have the state also having its capacity to run the, the economy and society in balance. If you move away from that corridor, they get into uh, what they call, on the upper side, despotism. Uh, they refer all the time to the state as the Leviathan. So above the 45 degree line, we have the despotic Leviathan. Below the 45 degree line, we have the absent Leviathan. That's to say the state isn't doing its job and uh, things may uh, result in chaos or anarchy. So what I'd like to suggest is we could think of the narrow corridor is where you have the freedom to do what you want, to live a good life. And what you're free from are the awful things that can happen outside the corridor. We'll come to what they might be in a moment. By the way, if people have pressing questions of clarification, please do uh, raise them with the chairman uh, as we go along. So moving to the next slide, <coughs> it's a picture taken from the book by Asimov and Robinson of life in the narrow corridor. <clears throat> it's an image from uh, 14th century Siena in Italy, and it shows people having a pretty good time. There's merchants buying and selling, and there's people um, dancing in the street, uh, the way that Latin people tend to do. And so it's, a, it's an example of what they see of as life in the narrow corridor. And the prerequisite they claim for this is this balance of power, the one we saw on the 45 degree line. So that's an image of the narrow corridor. <clears throat> and what we'd like to suggest is that uh, when Ken Binmore analyzed what he said are the conditions for having a social contract in operation, that we think that what he describes is roughly what must prevail for the, for the narrow corridor to, to work. So uh, in the narrow corridor, uh, what, we, what we feel, it's as if there was a social contract in force that successfully coordinates the activities of society. Uh, there's a kind of social contract. It's not a document that's written, it's an emergent way of behavior, uh, and it's a, it's, a, it's a form of behavior which is free and fair if you're in this corridor that we discussed. Now, uh, Ken comes up with three conditions for uh, social norms that will, su su will sustain such a social contract. The three conditions he comes up with are, first of all, uh, stability, as needed to satisfy individual incentives. So individuals have to have the incentive to participate in this, in this social contract uh, in some sort of Nash equilibrium at an individual level. At a societal level, there has to be an efficient selection of equilibrium. So that's the efficiency requirement. And there's a third broad requirement that whatever's going on should be seen as fair a fair balancing of power in society as a whole. So th those are the three general conditions that can be more specified as necessary 
for a free and fair social contract to exist of the sort we believe Asimov and Robinson are talking about. Uh, Ken refers to two historical events which he feels mark the beginning of such social contracts uh, in the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, the glorious revolution of 1688 for Britain, when uh, basically we got rid of the Stuart monarchy, who believed in the div divine right of kings, and had a much more constitutional monarchy, and for America, uh, the Declaration of Independence, when they got rid of the British. Uh, on the next slide, uh, I have a memo item, which is to remind you of these three conditions that, of Ken Binmore. So what you'll see in the narrow corridor, we now have the good ship Mayflower sailing up the narrow corridor. Uh, upwards, by the way, means progress. The, the powers of state and society are both making some progress. And, and there goes the Mayflower. Up, up the narrow corridor, uh, on the hull is S for stability, that was the first requirement. On the deck is efficiency, you want the crew to be doing the right kind of thing on the ship, and on the sail you'll see the requirement of fairness. So those are the three conditions that uh, Ken mentioned, and there's a caveat on the right hand side, which is what is, what is considered fair is very much contingent on the society you're looking at. So what we think of as fair in the West may not be what they think of as fair in Afghanistan right now, for example, or in China. There may be societal differences which come into the definition of fairness. <clears throat> um, and you'll see that uh, outside the narrow corridor, we mentioned a couple of things that may happen above the narrow corridor is a slippery slope. Once you leave the narrow corridor, you may slip, you may slip towards yesterday. Below the narrow corridor, when there's no, uh, no control, uh, the state is not doing its job, uh, you may uh, get into anarchy. So those are the dangers we referred to before. And uh, we can illustrate this on the next slide by these things that the narrow corridor is offering you freedom from. So on the top left, uh, there's a picture of the prisoners in the gulag in Soviet Russia. So this is an example we feel of despotism at work. Under Stalin, uh, we had the, the, the growth of the gulag and uh, this was an example of despotism. But below the 45 degree line, uh, there's, a di there's a picture here from Lebanon, and on the photograph taken, uh, someone was written on a concrete wall, my government did this. What did they do? The answer was they allowed Beirut to explode with um, stuff left in the harbour. So it was a devastating explosion, which suggested that the government wasn't doing its job. So these are the kinds of things outside the nar narrow corridor which the corridor offers freedom from. <clears throat> On a technical note, if there's time, Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have? Um, so five to eight minutes, that's okay. okay. Good. <clears throat> uh, the, the ways of modeling the dynamics that we've, you see in the diagram, uh, is a contest approach used by Asimov and Robinson, which looked at returns to scale and in investing and they have a frenzy of activity in the middle of the corridor, and they have very little activity outside, and that gives them their dynamics. In our paper, we use a competing species approach, where outside the narrow corridor, it's as if we have different species competing for spa space. There's a limited amount of land, <clears throat> and these different species compete for the land, and essentially it's a question of dog and stop. Inside the narrow corridor, you have an agreement not to do that. It's an agreement to live in peace and quiet. You get increasing returns. There is a risk, however, that, <clears throat> that's, that someone can come up with a, a, a social contract in which you keep people working 
and you can uh, live outside the narrow corridor with a neo-feudal social contract, which we'll come back to a bit later. <clears throat> with this competing species approach, what we find can be summarized in a couple of diagrams. The first one on the left should, you, should remind you of the diagram you've seen already from Asimov and Robinson. The same axes, the same story, a narrow corridor in the middle where things are peaceful and we have progress from, from the bottom to the top. Outside, we have divergence, instability, and movements towards dictatorship on the top left, movements towards chaos on the bottom right. So our story replicates Asimov and Robinson. However, we get this extra addition on the right-hand side, which is this kind of social contract where someone who leads you outside the narrow corridor has the big idea that, hey, I'd be better not wiping out the opposition. I'd, I'd like to leave them alive, working hard, delivering goodies, which I can exploit. So what we get is an equilibrium <coughs> where uh, we don't get a wiping out of the people. People are left to be, as it were, serfs, if we think of Soviet Russia, uh, free Soviet Russia, or as we'll come to in a moment, China. So you work very hard and the state gets the benefit. So we have a social contract, but it's not free and fair as we would see it, but it is efficient, it is stable, and it satisfies the criteria of fairness of a society, perhaps, of the Orient. <clears throat> so before we come back to China, let's talk about how you can avoid leaving the narrow corridor. Because if, if it's a place you'd like to stay in, how do you avoid leaving it? And um, uh, Ken mentions three mechanisms that are commonly used uh, in academia, by the way, as well as elsewhere. The first is mocking laughter. If there were more people in this room, there might have been some mocking laughter. <laughs> I can't hear it, so I hope it's not existing. Uh, the second stage to, to um, prevent people uh, misbehaving uh, is the boycott. You boycott people who misbehave. Finally, you kick them out. You throw them out of the room. The, those are the three mechanisms to try to protect an narrow corridor. And in the book by Asimov and Robinson, they do give some historical evidence for this. In ancient Greece, Christians instituted the practice of ostracism, which meant you marked a shred if you didn't like some guy. If there were enough of these, these tokens were marked, the person got kicked out of Athens for 10 years. So that was expulsion. In Siena, there was a mechanism where if you didn't like some candidate, was being too bossy, uh, you, could attempt, you could attach to his name the letters Kappa, a four letter Italian word which has an English equivalent with four letters beginning with S and ending in T. <laughs> so this was an example of, um, of, of creating laughter. <clears throat> However, in his recent paper, Ken Moore has drawn attention to a, a threat which he feels. Uh, is, is leading to a uh, possible breakdown of social contracts as we know them. What he says is that normally we rely on what's known as a folk theorem to sustain equilibrium. The folk theorem says <clears throat> that if the players in the game that we're looking at care sufficiently about the future, then any outcome of the game on which uh, the players may agree uh, with, with a contract which is enforceable, could emerge as a Nash equilibrium of the game if it has no end point. So we can get the equivalent of a social contract written down as a contract without any such contract, so long as the game has no ending and so long as people care about the future. But if they care about the future, they threaten to punish them. So if you come up with a cooperative equilibrium and they don't cooperate, get punished. So that's the mechanism. And that's what sustains 
in his view, the kind of social contracts in the, in the narrow corridor. So if you look at these four kinds of games, on the left-hand uh, column, we have one-shot games, but they can't sustain a, a social contract because there's no future. There's no way of punishing anyone who doesn't abide by the contract. Either, one, either two player or many players, no, no uh, reciprocal altruism, no social contract. However, if you have an infinite horizon game, indefinite time horizon, if you have two players or many players, you can sustain a social contract with reciprocal altruism, uh, thanks to the logic that Ken discusses in his book. However, in his recent paper, he says there is a flaw in the argument. The, the, the argument normally requires that, that only individuals challenge the equilibrium. But if you get a coalition following to challenge the equilibrium, they can break down the social contract. And what he warns is the kind of thing we saw on Trump was, was that kind of coalition. So, so, so coalitions can undermine the social contract. So that's the bad news. The, the good news was we can create a social contract by social norms. The bad news is that coalitions can undermine social norms. Well, what, what's the solution to this problem? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> one, don't forget the internet. Right. One argument, uh, he, by the way, Ken says the, the problem is the internet helped the coalition form. You get crowds to come together and meet you. <clears throat> one solution is to use the technology of the internet in the hands of the state. Let the state take over the internet. And that's what they're doing in China. So we, we think of this as the neo-feudal social contract uh, as in China. It's stable, efficient, and it seems consistent with the way of what Chinese, the way Chinese see society is being organized. <clears throat> so President Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping, according to the Financial Times, appears to be unveiling a blueprint for a modern high-tech dictatorship. They believe, that, 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 that Jinping and his colleagues, that the technologies, they can use the technology to shore up their own control of society and suppress political, political dissent. So instead of the Mayflower uh, cruising up the middle of the diagram, think of the Chinese junk moving up higher up the diagram with much more state power, much less uh, people power winding up with what I call the digital dictatorship at the top of the diagram. So that's one way of solving the problem. <clears throat> now, do, do we agree with this? Well, just to recap on the talk as a whole, uh, there seems to be a broad correspondence between the idea of the narrow corridor and what Linmore talks about as the necessary condition for a social contract. Um, <clears throat> But outside the narrow corridor, things seem very unstable. <clears throat> and what we found is there is this dangerous possibility of either going to dictatorship, chaos, or possibly a Chinese equilibrium where we get digital dictatorship. What's going on in the narrow corridor itself? Things are pretty bad, as we've heard already. There's all these challenges. And as, as Ken Binmore said, the internet itself is supplying the way in which coalitions can form and challenge the, the social contract as we know it in the West. So what's the answer? Well, of course, we don't endorse the digital di dictatorship of Xi, Xi, Xi Jinping. What we endorse is more the ideas of beverage, the idea of um, using to defend democracy by taking care of those who are left behind. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus and uh, Ben. That was really uh, fascinating and uh, I'm sure will provoke uh, a lively discussion. Let's take some questions. I haven't spotted any on the chat yet, but questions maybe from colleagues here and uh, from the other panelists before we see whether any are coming through the chat. 
Any questions? Um, I have one, uh, if I may briefly use um, my my position as, as as chair, which is this. So I think this juxtaposition or this contrast between digital dictatorship and defenders of democracy is a really really interesting one. I wonder though whether in uh, parts of the West there are now also some tendencies that might oddly resemble what's going on elsewhere. So I'm thinking of two aspects. One is what the American commentator uh, and writer Joel Kotkin has called neo-feudalism in America, which essentially he sees as a threat to the American middle class, but also to the middle class more generally. The middle class is actually sliding into you know, precariousness, including poverty, and you know, into something that doesn't resemble really a democratic, vibrant market economy. And John touched on some of those themes as well, the kind of new, um, you know, uh, generation of young graduates who live very, you know, economically and perhaps also culturally insecure uh, lives. And the other tendency, of course, is what some have called tech totalitarianism. That is not the old totalitarianism of a despot or, or, or a dictator, but the kind of surveillance capitalism that Shoshana Zuboff and others, you know, have written about. So, do you think that there may also be now some signs of this in other parts, of, I mean, in some parts of the West? And does that in any way um, sort of perhaps uh, alter your narrative a bit? Or do you still think that this sort of global competition between dictatorship and democracy is still the main problem? That would be my question. Yeah, Mar Marcus has uh, suggested that I take this question. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I hope this doesn't turn out to be too optimistic of you, but, but I think the, uh, what, the way I interpret the, the, the kind of uh, the storming of the capital in, in, uh, in the US is actually a, a, an ultimate triumph of, of US check, checks and balances over a kind of authoritarian um, sort of coup attempt by Trump. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, the way that I, and the way I interpret the, the, the idea of the social contract that keeps us in the narrow corridor is as a, um, a framework that gives you a, a, a stable equilibrium that stays in the narrow corridor. And if, and I guess I would interpret, say, the countries that are in the OECD as having that range of norms and, um, you know, and constitutional uh, sort of structures in place that have so far kept us on the path of kind of wig wiggishness or, or liberal democracy broadly defined. So I guess to me, um, we're, the countries that are in the narrow corridor are, are not in the immediate danger of falling out. Having said that, I was actually quite worried when I saw the events of early in, in COVID, I, I did wonder whether the sort of seize of the, the power grabs that you saw of government as they're interpreted as they were sort of reported on the cover of The Economist, whether they actually represented shocks that were in danger of taking, say, us in the UK and other countries out of the narrow corridor. I think what we've seen since then is, is, is sort of popular backlashes that have sort of brought us back in to, to the narrow corridor. So, so far I'm, I'm optimistic that the, um, that, the, that the countries that we've seen in the corridor are still there and, and aren't really in danger of, of falling out. But this is very much the framework that we've set up to have this discussion. So the idea is that shocks can come along that challenge, um, you, you know, the challenge country, there are countries that would like to get into the narrow corridor. I and mean, you might say, sort of Russia under Yeltsin, there was an attempt to get Russia into the corridor. I think most people would argue that that's failed. Um, and, and, at this, and we've got other countries that are sort of trying to come into that narrow corridor from below. And we'll see whether they get enough of a sort of boost to get into there, the sort of Vietnams of this world, or, you know, the countries that look as if they're in political flux and could end up with more democracy. But the overall framework is to think of countries as being in that narrow corridor and whether shocks come along.
would actually kind of threaten to knock them out. Yeah. And that's absolutely the framework, you know, how the framework that we're setting up. Okay. Thank you very much. Two questions on the chat, which I'd like to, uh, to turn to. One by Bernard Casey, I'll read it out. What does taking care of those left behind actually mean? How do you make it more precise? Uh, you know, also building on what, what John Carlos was saying in his talk. So some thoughts perhaps on that. I'll share the second question with you too, and maybe a response to both, and we'll move on to the final uh, presentation before our break. And the second question is by Neville, and, uh, Neville Manuel, and he's asking, what are the routes back to the narrow corridor for societies already outside of it? What logic or rationale might support such a return? So other yeah. cases where they've dropped out, and they're trying to get back in. So those two questions, uh, please. A very short answer to the first question, I guess, are the sort of things we've been talking about today. It seems to me that's precisely what's been going on. People are worried about people being disaffected, uh, blue collar workers, people without education. And so I think the kinds of discussion, the first, the first presentation, I think was right on the button. So that's a pretty cheap shot by me to say, well, the answer was given before the question. <laughs> maybe my course would like to yeah. yeah I would interpret those two questions as in a sense being flip sides of the so same coin one of the ideas that Asimov and Robinson push in their book is that in order for society to be prepared to let the state have more power and make more progress in running the country the state actually has to give them greater security so it is about an exchange of um exchange of powers if you like uh, and so um so for example uh um i mean it's going to differ from one society to another but say for example greater jobs uh it, there's a perception that the you know the the, the return to capital is something that benefits the elite more than the rest of society. So now the rest of society, you know, the median voter, if I can put it this way, sits within the rest of society. So in order for people, uh, in order for the median voter as an ordinary person to vote for a party that gives greater leeway to the development of capital markets, they have to see that there's something in it for them. They have to see greater um, sort of uh, social safety nets, uh, greater fairness through tax and redistribution for them in order to be able to vote for a party, to be prepared to vote for a party who is also saying that they are going to liberalise capital markets. Mm -hmm. So it's that exchange of power mm -hmm. that is crucial to being in this sort of sweet spot of this narrow corridor. Mm -hmm. yeah. So essentially it goes back to your point about you know the conceptions of freedom and maybe we have to sacrifice Absolutely. some individual freedom in exchange for some security provided by by the state or to, to tie this back to the whole idea of of um of, uh, of populism what we're talking about uh, the, the, the focus of this workshop in a sense you could interpret populism as in as a kind of an idea of mob rule and that, that's how i um, interpret Ken talking about coalition formation through the internet. If the if if minorities feel threatened by the kind of the, the, the majority ganging up on them, then that that actually ends up being the main threat to this mm. sort of this kind of sweet spot of exchange of powers. Great. Well, thank you very much again, both uh, Marcus and Ben. For fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll move on seamlessly to the last one before our break, which uh, is at this point going to be rather short, but they will be a break. Uh, you will be relieved to hear. Um, again, my thanks to John Crellis, who uh, has to leave, as we said. But thank you so much, John, for your uh, talk to kick us off earlier. Uh, and we will say something about the special issue, and we also hope that everyone here um, today will also submit a paper and then we'll share that with uh, our participants as well at a later stage. As I said, hopefully we can launch the specialty when it's published here in person at the National Institute. John, thanks again very much for being with us and um, we'll, we'll see you very soon. So the next talk um, is by uh, Aaron Adani and Andy Summers, uh, Building Back Better with the Wealth Maps. Um, and just very brief introductions.
Aaron is Assistant Professor in the Economics Department at the University of Warwick and Research Associate at the CAGE Research Centre and a number of colleagues here have had associations with CAGE or have them uh, and so this is um, very good uh, to see. And Andy Summers is Associate Professor of Law at the LSE uh, Law School. Uh, now, my understanding is that it's Andy who will present. So Andy, a very warm welcome and thank you very much uh, for your presentation in advance. Over to you. Hello everyone and uh, thanks very much for this uh, invitation to um, present today. Um, this is a presentation um, that's co-authored with um, Aaron Advani and um, quite different from the preceding presentations in that um, I'm looking very specifically at a particular policy response um, that might fit with the theme of um, populism, although one of the questions that I'm going to look at in this presentation is would a wealth tax be popular and also what's the role of um, uh, if I can flatter ourselves, experts um, in quotes in um, in sort of coming up with policies that meet um, popular um, priorities. So this issue of a wealth tax is um, it's current and it's becoming, I suppose, more and more um, toward the surface. I, I feel of um, debates about tax policy generally. Um, in a way that strikingly a wealth tax has been completely off um, the political agenda in the UK, at least for, for I would say several decades um, from the 1970s onwards until um, around about five, five years ago, I would say, um, there was hardly any discussion of um, a wealth tax. Um, and now it's something which um, I saw even earlier today, an article um, in the newspaper saying that Keir Starmer was um, thinking about more taxes on wealth. He hasn't um, given any indication of um, whether he intends to come up with any kind of policy proposal on this um, occasion. But uh, in broad brush strokes, um, that, that follows, I think, a quite um, general trend of um, this idea of well, why can't we raise taxes on wealth has sort of entered the lexicon of um, um, sort of mainstream media commentary on on tax policy, and I've noticed that over the past few days in the debates around um, the new health and social care levy, as why don't we tax wealth um, as an alternative? So um, here, I think. Um, what I want to focus on is a particular type of, uh, a particular way of taxing wealthy um, individuals, um, distinct from the, the broader sense of um, taxes on wealth, which might encompass things like inheritance tax, um, income tax on investment income, capital gains tax, council tax, insofar as you can sort of think of that as a um, tax on property, although it's of course not not really. Um, but here, when I talk about a wealth tax in this presentation, I'm talking more specifically about a tax on the ownership of wealth. Um, so in other words, the amount of tax that you pay depends on how much um, wealth you own, distinct from you know, what, you might, what you do with it or how much it goes up in value in relation to capital gains tax or how much of it you give away. This is a tax purely in virtue of the amount of wealth that, um, that an individual or potentially a, a household, if you're looking at a um, uh, household unit taxation, of, um, how much they own. So that means um, also what distinguishes a wealth tax from something like a property tax is the idea that fundamentally that it's, that it's a broad based tax on assets. Um, and so um, presumptively, at least, it would apply to all um, all types of marketable um, asset, net of all um, debts. So, for example, if you own a house, um, the your net wealth would be your the value of the house less the value of your outstanding mortgage, um, plus all of uh, all of the other assets and debts that you have. Um, and there's there's two quite distinct types of um, wealth tax. Um, actually, Nick, who's um, following for me after the, the break, is looking at um, this idea of a one-off wealth tax, I think, 
Um, but there, and there, there have been several examples of those in the past in response to major crises, particularly after the world wars, and to a lesser extent after the global financial crisis. Uh, and indeed, actually, one, I guess, Nick, you can add to your um, list from Argentina, um, a one-off wealth tax already following the um, um, COVID-19 um, crisis. But most of the examples we have um, from international experience of wealth taxes comes from recurring annual um, wealth taxes. So the amount of tax, like income taxes, a tax um, on the amount of income that you receive over an annual um, period of an annual wealth tax is levied once per year, but on, on the snapshot of wealth that you have effectively on the kind of census date um, each year. So what I want to look at in this presentation and linking to the kind of theme of um, populism is first of all to sort of think about some of the um, bigger picture reasons why people might be, uh, why a wealth tax might be um, more and more on the agenda. Here I am looking at some um, facts about the wealth distribution. And I think I would say first, first off that that isn't necessarily a good explanation for why we have such interest in wealth taxes. There's probably a lot more to be said about the um, uh, why it is that taxes on wealth have sort of gained prominence in in national media and amongst commentators that might not actually have very much to do with the underlying trends in the distribution of wealth. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to look at um, some of those um, drivers and trends first off, um, and then think about this question of would a, um, would a wealth tax be popular, um, distinct from a kind of populist policy perhaps, but what are the um, uh, to what extent um, does the polling evidence that we have suggest that a wealth tax would be um, something that the public would support? And crucially, kind of what, what are the reasons why they might support it and what can we learn about that in terms of the um, possible design of the policy? Um, and then finally, I want to look at the question of whether a wealth tax um, could work in the sense of is it um, practically implementable in a way that will achieve those objectives that, um, that the public seems to want. Um, so there's a question here, I guess, put more broadly about how to deliver on populist um, policies. Um, and um, there I'm going to look at the, the work that um, that Aaron, my co-author on, on this presentation, and also with um, Emma Chamberlain, who is a um, tax barrister, um, the work that we did for the Wealth Tax Commission, which um, reported its findings in um, December last year. So first off, just to observe that um, aggregate wealth, so in, re in, in, in relation to um, national income, has been rising significantly um, for the past um, 30 or 40 years, um, from about um, three times um, national income up to now over 700, that's uh, up, uh, up to seven times. Um, and yet wealth is very unequally distributed. I haven't got the direct comparison here, but it's much more unequally distributed than um, income. Um, if we look at the lowest, um, roughly almost half of the um, population have basically no net wealth um, at all, whilst those in the top decile have, um, on average, wealth of 1.5 um, million um, at the family at the, the family level. Um, and what's kind of even more striking is that that, um, that average over the top decile. Um, itself conceals quite a lot of inequality within the top. Um, and so if you look just at the top 1%, um, that figure is more like 5 million um, on a half top basis. And we, we don't have, uh, I don't have the figures here, but you can then zoom in on the 1% and you can see a, a similar scale of inequality within that top um, 1%. Um, so wealth is extremely unequally distributed and it's rising in aggregate. What that means is that there's a helpful re report by the Resolution Foundation showing that um, if you look at shares of wealth, um, top, top shares, they haven't changed that much over time. But because wealth is unequally distributed and is going up in aggregate, the actual 
pounds and pence gaps between people are, are stretching out. Um, and that might be, uh, I, I think that to me is the explanation of why people are potentially getting more concerned about wealth inequality, even though um, certain um, sections of the commentary out will say, are oh, that the statistics don't show that health inequality has gotten worse. It's this combination of con uh, continuation in um, very unequal shares coupled with this rise in aggregate wealth, meaning that the gaps are getting stretched out. Um, so um, what, um, what, what are the factors driving um, wealth accumulation? Well, I'm going to kind of simplify quite a lot here, but um, if you think about whether this is due to people um, differential rates of savings or whether it's due to changes in the value of the assets that people already hold. And the main message here, which I've illustrated across a few slides, is that actually it's asset price inflation rather than active saving, which is driving um, these um, differences. Um, so the richest get the largest returns on the wealth that they already have. Um, and these are, this is um, data that I'm showing you here from before um, COVID. Um, but in a way, COVID is kind of, um, it, it, there's been quite a lot said about um, increases in savings rates at the top. So if you had a lot of wealth, um, you may have spent less during um, the pandemic and been able to save more and accumulated wealth in that, um, through that mechanism. Um, but actually, it's still, again, the um, asset price um, increases that have driven um, the increase in wealth um, inequality over this um, most recent period. So I think that this is getting, um, it's getting increasing traction, um, as we say, amongst um, uh, news commentators and um, amongst the public, perhaps as a consequence of that. Um, but there's a question about whether taxing wealth would be um, a popular um, policy. As part of the um, work that we did for the Wealth Tax Commission, we commissioned a large scale survey um, that was undertaken by Ipsos Mori in the summer of last year. Um, so after the coronavirus um, pandemic kind of was underway, but um, about over a year ago now. Um, and we thought rather than asking in the abstract, would you support this new tax? In, in public policy terms, it's, it's typically more sensible to say um, which of these options would you prefer um, on the basis that um, uh, we'd like you to get a different answer if you just ask, would you like to um, or would you like to introduce a wealth tax versus would you rather introduce a wealth tax than some of these other realistic alternatives? Um, and what we found was quite high support um, for a wealth tax, although I'm, I'm going to give some caveats to these um, findings in a moment in terms of what we can kind of learn from this. Um, but it seems at least that a wealth tax is more popular than these alternatives of, for example, increasing income tax or VAT. We didn't unfortunately put national insurance contributions on, um, on here. It would be the popularity of that against these other um, options. And when we tried to make it even more specific, um, the um, saying, how would you um, raise um, an extra 10 billion pounds, which is actually roughly what the government was targeting from this um, new national insurance levy. Um, we let people put their preferred form of a wealth tax up against these alternatives, um, and a wealth tax came out that seems much more um, uh, popular than any of those. Um, having said that, um, in fact, I'll skip to the uh, first. Um, we took the view on the Wealth Tax Commission that it is sometimes dangerous to take polling evidence as a sort of direct uh, indicator of the policy that you should pursue. Um, and then it's better to try to use um, public opinion to guide what the public wants policymakers to achieve, and then for, in quotes, experts, so that was us on the commission, um, to try to figure out what policy will actually deliver those um, objectives. 
um, <coughs> rather than rather, so it, that implies here that rather than asking the public directly whether they would support um, a wealth tax, because frankly, lots of people don't haven't haven't heard very much about a wealth tax before this survey. And when they're asked, they might reasonably not really know what it actually um, entails, although we could give them some information. Um, so rather than looking directly at what the policy preferences are, we also tried to find out um, what people's sorts of concerns and motivations were. Um, and we gave various um, options for why you might, might support a wealth tax and ask people to um, like which ones um, they found most persuasive. And in favour of a wealth tax, um, and going back to the, the statistics I showed you earlier, um, by far the, the uh, most support came from the argument that the gap between the rich and poor um, is too large. So that, that in some ways surprised us that, for example, raising money for public services or filling the hole in public finances caused by COVID-19 didn't rank anywhere near as um, strongly as um, this concern about um, the rich having got richer and the gap between rich and poor being too large. And people's main concern, interestingly, um, was not um, particularly concerns about the fairness of the policy, but more questions about whether it could actually be delivered. So people seem sceptical um, that, that, that a wealth tax would effectively succeed in reducing the gap between rich and poor because of this concern that the wealthy will avoid the tax, uh, either by you know, emigrating or finding ways of avoiding it through um, loopholes. And so to us on the Wealth Tax Commission, that pointed to um, the, the question about whether a wealth tax could be designed in such a way that it, it could, would be difficult to avoid um, and that it could actually um, raise money um, in a way that didn't necessarily actively redistribute wealth from rich to poor, but that raised um, the revenue um, from those with the most capacity to um, pay. And so um, our task on the commission um, was to look at all options for a wealth tax, both questions of kind of principle and um, of practice. So, you know, on what grounds might a wealth tax be justified in principle, but then also um, how would you design a wealth tax so that it actually achieved those objectives and didn't end up being undermined as so many of our other taxes do by, for example, exemptions and reliefs and, um, and other design flaws. Um, and so to do that, we, we brought together um, Aaron Advani, who, who's an economist, uh, myself, I'm an um, academic lawyer at, at the LSE, uh, and Emma Chamberlain, as I mentioned, is a tax barrister. And we tried to pool some of that expertise to try and get across the issues of both um, principle and policy. Um, and we also drew on these evidence papers, so the um, uh, some of the charts I showed you earlier on the distribution of wealth and also this polling evidence was drawn from these evidence papers that fed into um, this project. Um, and we tried to synthesize that evidence then in our um, final report, um, which we published in December last year. Um, and I'm happy to, in questions to sort of go, um, go into any more detail on how these um, on our recommendations and the design of the tax that we propose. Um, but this is just to summarize our um, recommendations. So um, we suggested that um, if the government chooses to raise taxes, and this was, of course, was in the context specifically of all the talk about needing to raise taxes specifically to deal with the coronavirus crisis rather than for ongoing um, spending. Um, the government should implement a one-off wealth tax in preference to increasing taxes on worker spending. So in, instead of increasing VAT or income tax or national insurance contributions, um, the government should um, implement a one-off wealth tax. And what that, what, what's meant by there by one-off is that it would be assessed as a single point in time uh, and the assessment would not be repeated. But nevertheless, the, the tax itself could then be paid off, a bit like you pay off a loan, over a number of years. So it wouldn't mean that you, that you were taking the tax um, 
even collecting the tax from people all in one go, we actually suggested that um, that the um, one-off wealth tax could be levied, for example, at a rate of 5% of people's wealth, but paid over five years. Um, so assessed once in year one, the amount that you have to pay, but you, you pay it off at effectively 1% per year, over five years. Um, we also looked at the option for, a, um, for an annual wealth tax. Um, where you actually would recur the assessment each year. So you do a new assessment of people's wealth each year and charge them a percentage of that. Um, but we concluded that actually it would be better instead of introducing that new annual wealth tax to our system to reform our existing taxes on wealth. So those others um, that I mentioned, inheritance tax, capital gains tax, the way we tax it in um, investment income, for example. And we, we, put, we, we suggested some, what some of the reforms that we would favour on that. And I think the main point to emphasise is that what we envisage by reforming existing taxes on wealth are, involves quite major structural changes, not just little tinkering, um, as we've seen in, um, in previous years. Um, and then finally, we looked at the, quest, the, the question of when, if at all, or under what conditions might an annual wealth tax be justified. And I think this probably links back most closely to the populist question, because in the end, um, the only sort of form of annual wealth tax that we thought might actually be um, deliverable um, is one with a very high threshold um, that's really targeting the, um, the super rich, so to speak. Um, and it may be that that when people um, have in mind popular support for a wealth tax, it might be that form of annual wealth tax actually that people um, are looking for. And, we, and um, we, we talk in the report about how you could make that work without excessive um, avoidance. Um, so just, just to finish up, just to show you the, the amount that's at stake um, here. Um, I mean, this is not a, um, a sort of um, minor, um, tweak around the edges of our, of our tax system. Um, the sorts of uh, sums that we um, modelled that could be raised by a one-off wealth tax was as much if you were willing to tax um, all, um, all wealth above um, half a million pounds per individual. So think of essentially millionaire couples um, at a rate of 1% per year over five years, so that's 5% in total. Um, we estimate the amount that can be raised, and this is this is including um, taking into account behavioural responses and administrative costs. Could be as much as two hundred and sixty billion pounds, which is um, you know, in the context of the um, the government's national insurance rise that raises twelve billion per year. We're talking here about raising two hundred and sixty billion over five years um, from a one-off wealth tax. So it, wealth um, that was as as I showed at the outset, um, aggregate wealth has been increasing hugely. It's also very concentrated. If you have a wealth tax on um, those at the top of the income distribution, even at what looks nominally like relatively low rates, there are huge sums of revenue and, um, available um, potentially. Um, and if you want to model your own wealth tax, finally, um, we also um, put together a um, um, simulator for this and this was um i don't, I don't know quite what it's, um called this populist or not but we were trying to get the um the public involved in um in this work a bit more and say if you don't like the thresholds and rates that we've modeled in our um, paper you can set the rates and thresholds wherever you like um, and this um, simulator will tell you how much it would raise and what part of the distribution it would come from. And now since then, we've even um, uh, improved this simulator somewhat so that you can put in the wealth that you have and it will tell you how much you would pay under this um, tax. Um, so that's, um, that's a very um, brief summary of, um, of the work that we did on this. Um, but I, I'd be really interested in, in thoughts, particularly on the link populism. Andy, thank you very much indeed uh, for that really interesting presentation. We've got a few questions. I will, uh, I think, just pick two or three because we are, um, you know, a little bit behind time. Um, we will have a break 
and so there will be, you know, some time to have a, a breather. But let me just put three questions to you, uh, Andy, if I may. The first is from um, Yin Jin, who's asking, um, given that those who have the greatest amount of wealth can raise the greatest amount of debt, and also at the best rates, how would the all S's, all debt work under this proposal? Then a question from uh, Sayantan. Instead of a wealth tax, why not a tax on all forms of economic rent? For example, if the wealth has been rising from the top uh, decade because asset values have been going up and the returns to wealth depend on the level of wealth, how much of this is economic rent? So real estate uh, in particular locations. And um, Kesha uh, Bhattarai is asking, how do you still need do you still see needs for allowance and exemptions while implementing a wealth tax? And are such allowances and exemptions efficient? So those three questions, Andy, in any order, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll break for, for tea and coffee. Great, so um, yes, this question about um, debt. Um, so, so it's certainly right that the, um, the more wealth you have to start with, the more you can leverage that wealth. Um, taking um, loans from it and funding your lifestyle then out of um, uh, out of that debt. Um, that shouldn't though um, pose any um, threat to the way that we assess people's wealth, provided that the debt that you take out, you end up, um, and if you take a loan out on your house, for the simplest, um, the simplest case is a mortgage on a um, property, of course, you have the mortgage debt, but then you've been given this lump sum of money which you use to buy the house. So, so you're getting um, um, the the, uh, the debt that you take out is shown on your balance sheet as an asset somewhere else, unless you consume it. So it's true that if somebody had lots and lots of um, assets, they took out lots and lots of debt, and then they blew it all on um, foreign holidays or something. Um, then those people would not appear to have very much um, net wealth, um, but they wouldn't eventually need to pay that um, money back. So um, we, we don't think that the, um, the issue of debt kind of poses a threat to the way that we um, compute the tax base, but it is an important point to observe that um, um, debt's not only an issue at the bottom in the sense of problem debt, it's also used um, um, in a... Uh, in a way that increases people's um, spending capacity at the top um, through leveraging existing assets. Um, uh, instead of a wealth tax, one a tax on all forms of economic rent. Well, um, I mean, we've also written about um, capital gains tax in, in other work, and we do think that the rates of capital gains tax could, should be significantly higher than they are. Um, the, the difficulty we have with capital gains tax is that at the moment, the way the tax is structured is it, it's only paid on realisation of assets. So what it's only paid when you sell assets. So ideally what you would want if you wanted um, to capture these um, asset price gains that have happened, for example, as a result of COVID-19, you might want a tax on accrued gains. Um, we actually argue in our, um, uh, even if the asset hasn't been sold, um, we argue in our, um, final report actually that there is an argument here in favour of a wealth tax which is that um, at a macro level one of the responses to um, COVID-19 has effectively been to keep rates, um, keep the um, central bank interest rate low and to prolong quantitative easing and we know that that has, uh, that it, in, in uh, in consequence of that, there's going to be increases in asset prices, and that's going to benefit the people who already hold assets. And actually, we argue in the in the final report that that's an argument in favour of having a, um, a wealth tax. It's almost like a down payment on the future gains that the existing holders of assets will get from quantitative easing. Um, then, do we still see needs for allowances and exemptions? I mean, actually, we see exemptions as, as by far the greatest threat to the efficacy of a um, wealth tax. And we argue strongly for a comprehensive um, tax base with really minimal um, exemptions. I mean, there can be allowances in the sense of a non-taxable allowance, so a zero, a zero rate threshold at the bottom, that's fine. Um, but in terms of exemptions for particular types of assets, certainly with an annual wealth tax where people can respond on a year-by-year -year basis to the tax, um, those exemptions create 
very large um, distortions to behavior. And we've observed that from other annual wealth taxes abroad. Um, and have often ended up being the reason why wealth taxes have not raised very much money um, because um, certain assets have been exempt and then everyone piles into those asset classes and it creates distortions and limits to revenue that you, you can obtain. So, um, so we think that for either a one-off wealth tax or an annual wealth tax to work, it does need to be on a, on a comprehensive um, tax base. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, responses and again for your presentation. Um, that was really, really, really interesting, uh, especially in the current context where we're debating what sort of taxation we might want to use, not only for social care, but also for financing other uh, parts of, of public policy uh, in the post uh, uh, pandemic context. Um, I suggest we now break for 10 minutes. Um, so that we can all um, get ourselves some tea or coffee and then come back at about 11.25, at which point we'll hear from Nico Donovan. So thank you all very much. That concludes the first part and see you in about two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
I'm in shock. So. All right. <laughs> Nick, will you speak from where you are? Um, if I can be heard. Uh, yes, we will. Uh, we should check that in just a second. <clears throat> Well, uh, we, we, are you thinking about our students describing yeah. themselves as uh, <laughs> residents of prison? Residents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, not the uh, administration's finest hour, by any means. Uh, Have you recovered? Has it, has it been smoothed over? Are the, are the students uh, no longer prisoners? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, I. I are they just good lobbyists? I mean, they, you know, never underestimate the ability of students to coordinate. I, the, the extent of self expression through the means of post it notes applied to windows is, uh, is pretty impressive. impressive. You know, yes. like, you've, got to, you've got to give them credit. Yeah, that. yeah, that's right. As a lobby group, they were immensely effective, <laughs> yes. weren't they? <laughs> He said he seemed to be talking about a one off, uh, a one off um, that would be paid over five years. Okay, I propose we uh, make a start again after what was a rather short and sharp uh, coffee break, uh, for which I apologize for some technical problems right at the beginning. Start a bit late, and of course, each. Uh, presentation discussion uh, we weren't you know keen to cut short so um, just a little bit behind schedule well, we've got half an hour at the end so uh, having already taken lots of questions I think that half an hour might be a bit shorter um, so without further ado it gives me great pleasure to welcome and introduce uh, Dr. Nicola Donovan uh, his presentation, as you can see, is entitled Retribution, Restitution and Reconstruction, a lovely uh, alliteration, uh, Tax Policy as Crisis Response, uh, which follows on from the presentation we heard before the break on wealth taxation. Nick is Senior Lecturer in the Future Economies Research Centre at Manchester Metropolitan University. Nick, very warm welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, do speak from uh, your current position, if you wish, or come here, but I think in terms of the sound, we should all be good. Okay. We'll wait for any signals from our colleagues to see whether we have to speak up. Or... Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, thanks very thanks much. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, and yes, if you can't actually hear me, please do indicate. Hopefully, somehow the communication will filter through to me here. Um, so today, um, as Adrian said, I'm going to be talking about tax policy as a crisis response. And we can see this as feeding into ideas of populism really in two distinct ways. Uh, on the one hand, these taxes uh, have often been reduced, introduced in crisis situations as a response to popular economic discontent. Uh, so they might be seen as an effort to contain populist demands on the one hand, and then on the other hand, they have also often uh, been condemned as populist too. So, um, the work that I'm going to present to you today builds out of some research I conducted last year around one-off wealth taxation, uh, actually as part of the Wealth Tax Commission, uh, led by uh, Aaron, Andy and Emma, um, as uh, mentioned in the previous presentation. So I looked at historical examples of one-off wealth tax uh, from World War I, from World War II, and also some interesting forms of uh, one off or at least temporary wealth taxation in the wake of the global financial crisis. So that project looked very much at what it takes for a one off wealth tax to work. Um, in this presentation and in this paper, I'm focusing on, if you like, the political preconditions 
for this kind of policy response. So what kinds of crisis conditions create a political opportunity for unusual forms of tax policy? And just to clarify my terms a bit here, when I talk about tax policy as a crisis response, I'm talking about changes to the tax system that are intended to remediate the crisis in some way. So that might be um, funding the costs of dealing with the crisis, potentially uh, including eliminating some debt that has arisen over the course of the crisis, uh, compensating or penalising particular groups, uh, and also funding post-crisis recovery. Um, if there are any modern monetary theorists in the audience who don't like me saying that tax funds things, uh, then if you replace fund with offset the inflationary implications of creating money to do the same thing. It amounts to the same thing. Uh, anyway, um, so these kinds of uh, taxes, as a result of that crisis-focused remit, uh, they're often one-off or time-bound, so they're limited to the crisis context and its immediate aftermath. Uh, they might reflect or respond to distributive changes resulting from that crisis, maybe targeting groups deemed responsible for that crisis in some way, uh, and they're also linked to spending and debts arising from that crisis. So there's a sense in which the, the costs that they're supposed to address are finite, finite. And we might distinguish that from financing new open-ended spending commitments, whether that's uh, the creation of the NHS in uh, the uh, wake of uh, World War II, for example, or uh, saving the NHS, as the government would like us to believe they have done, uh, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic, which would require a continual uh, adjustment to the tax system. Now you can do this kind of uh, tax policy as crisis response in two ways. You can have temporary changes to normal taxes, so you might put up rates, reduce thresholds, change your administration somewhat, um, but you can also introduce unusual taxes and for reasons of space, scope and time, those are the ones that I'm going to focus on in this presentation. Um, there have been examples of sector-specific taxes to respond to crises, uh, excess profits taxes, uh, and wealth and wealth increment taxes. Um, and here, here's a list of various examples from various crises, but I am going to focus uh, just on the first two for reasons of time. So I'm going to fo focus on excess profits taxes uh, from the world wars uh, and also from the Korean War, um, and also um, capital levies or forms of one-off wealth taxation, which Andy helpfully touched on before the break. So, um, excess profits taxes first. So, an excess profits tax um, is based on the logic that in a crisis, some sectors, businesses, uh, etc., fare particularly well. So, if you're supplying uh, PPE and there's a global pandemic, if you're supplying munitions and there's a global war, you tend to do uh, particularly well. Uh, meanwhile, some sectors fare particularly badly, so um, if your restaurant is forced to shutter uh, because, uh, you, uh, because there's a lockdown and um, social distancing conditions, or if your restaurant is forced to shutter because your meat supplies are rationed, uh, then you're going to fare uh, particularly badly. So the idea is that actually to reflect this unfairness of crisis, so crisis has an arbitrary impact on, on different people, different sectors, uh, we're going to concentrate on those excess profits arising from the crisis, which obviously begs the question of, well, how do we decide what an excessive profit is? Uh, how do we decide when these things are abnormally high? Um, and history gives us a three different ways of looking at this really. One is sector-specific taxes, sector-specific levies, so uh, there are examples of munitions levies in particular in the run-up uh, to uh, and the progress of uh, the world wars. Um, you might see levies on the armament sector, um, but more interesting and much more significant in revenue, revenue terms have been taxes that defined that excessive profit on the basis of some combination of either a baseline of pre-war profits or, or an imputed normal return on capital. And anything over that threshold is, is deemed to be excessive. Uh, now, there are really interesting economic arguments to be had about the desirability or not of these taxes. So uh, on one hand, they might be a tax on rent if it's uh, abnormal returns from an unanticipated crisis. You can say that maybe they're stifling the reallocation of resources to uh, things that you want to have more resources allocated to, uh, and so on and so forth. 
Um, but generally speaking, when these taxes have been introduced, these kind of theoretical niceties um, within the technical discussion have given way to a broader elite level focus on does it raise lots of money, uh, to which the answer has often been yes. So uh, the next slide has uh, uh, the returns from the excess profits duty, the UK's World War I uh, excess profits tax as a percentage of UK government revenue. And as you can see, when it was actually introduced, um, it raised over a quarter of the government revenue in the latter years of the war and the early years of the recovery. Now, what's interesting politically about excess profits taxes is you can see the motivations as coming uh, from two different um, kinds of argument. And I think it's very important to distinguish these. So on the one hand, you have the idea that excess profits taxes are effectively trying to balance burdens. So what, what you need here as a precondition is a crisis that has an arbitrary impact on different sectors. Uh, and because that impact is arbitrary, you're just trying to level that impact out. So there's no necessary, necessary moral condemnation associated with this idea of uh, balancing of burdens. Um, but actually, in practice, when excess profits taxes have been introduced, um, if you look at the cases that I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, you'll see um, that they have all been linked to widespread discussion of of profiteering. So there is a sense that businesses who are profiting, inverted commas, excessively um, have been taking advantage of the crisis nefariously to some extent um, to exploit their position of power. And where that demand comes from, um, where that perception comes from, is these taxes have been introduced in periods of very high inflation. So um, people have uh, evidence of in the popular press, in debates in Parliament about uh, the large profits made by certain companies, and they also see when they go to the shops, they see the price of what they're paying for go up, and they connect the two. Not always perfectly rationally, obviously, but they do. And this seems to be an important precondition for this kind of tax. You need that high inflation, um, at least in the historical examples I've talked about, to really get the momentum rolling for that kind of tax. Um, and you can see it both in the quantitative data on inflation in the run-up to the creation of these taxes, but also in the qualitative discussion of these taxes in the press and in uh, the public sphere more broadly, so uh, representative bodies and so on and so forth. Now, interestingly, one-off wealth taxes or capital levies actually have similar dynamics in their debate and similar patterns to uh, the political support and paying them. Um, just to, to reiterate, Andy touched on this before the break, but capital levies are essentially one-off taxes on household wealth. And they, actually, they have sometimes historically been on, on business assets as well. Um, you assess the wealth of households at a particular point in time, but you might give them several years to to pay off uh, the amount that they are assessed for. Um, if well executed, uh, they have a number of attractive technical properties, particularly around their lack of distortionary effects. So if they're unanticipated and people don't expect them to happen again, then actually it should not, uh, by definition, change people's behaviours. So that's on the technical side, but actually in terms of the non-technical political justifications, we see an overlap with uh, those two considerations I mentioned with excess profits taxes. Um, so on the one hand, you have the fact that crises have an arbitrary impact on um, people's uh, wealth, uh, because some people's houses get bombed, some people lose their jobs because they're in a, a sector that is unfavored by the crisis in question, um, and so on and so forth. So some people's wealth declines arbitrarily through no fault of their own. Some people's wealth increases because uh, they uh, happen to be in one of those high demand sectors, they're lucky enough to keep working, uh, they're able to put some excess savings aside because they're not allowed to consume, etc, etc. So, um, again, we see those two justifications. And what's interesting um, is that actually we see that second justification um, uh, around, um, around the idea that actually there is something nefarious about having uh, 
who made money in wartime or made money during a crisis as well. We don't see it in all examples of capital weapons, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, but we see it in quite a few. And, and one other thing I want to flag here is, is actually, when I say capital levies, there are two distinct forms of wealth taxation we can see here. One is uh, a one-off uh, assessment of post-crisis wealth. Um, but the other, which in some ways reflects the crisis justification a bit more, is a tax upon the incremental change in your wealth uh, during a crisis. And <clears throat> actually, this latter historically has lent itself to more punitive arguments for taxation. Um, and we can see that when we look at this um, chart of post-World War II capital levies. So um, the countries that are asterisked are countries uh, that, in addition to having a capital levy, a one-off wealth tax, also applied an incremental charge on wartime enrichment. Uh, so you're increasing wealth over the course of the war. Um, and actually, if you look at the debates in those countries around those taxes and also around the, the post-war climate more, more broadly, you can see that uh, there is a concern about not just uh, profiteering in the crisis, but actually active collaboration uh, with the occupying power, uh, collaboration uh, with the Nazi forces. So there is definitely a punitive element uh, that we can see in those kinds of levies. Uh, in case you're wondering about the inclusion of Austria as occupied power, um, the, uh, the post-World post War II uh, Second Republic in Austria was quite keen to portray itself for obvious reasons as, as, as the uh, first victim of, of Nazi occupation rather than, uh, rather than as uh, sort of a, a willing uh, party to um, the, the conflict in the Third Reich. So we can see that kind of punitive justification there, and you can see it in the levels of taxation as well. So if you look at the rates, the asterisk rates are the uh, levels of capital enrichment taxation, the, the wartime wealth increase tax we can see there. And you can see actually these are very high levels, punitive levels of taxation. In France, actually, um, you effectively pay 120% of your wartime enrichment tax because you pay your 20% tax on it, and then you will pay the 100% tax on uh, the bit of your wealth that uh, arose during your time. Um, but it's interesting that actually punitive motivations are not necessary. And, and the German last announcement, like, which in many ways was the most successful of this uh, set of um, post World War II um, capital levies, actually focused on a very different set of arguments. Um, and you can debate whether actually maybe this is an anti populist sense set of arguments instead of, uh, if you like, a populist focus on the elite and criticizing the elite and tearing down the elite, uh, you instead have a focus on the people and actually building up the people instead. Uh, because the focus of the last announced life was very much on uh, restitution and post-war reconstruction. Uh, you had uh, a third of households um, uh, within uh, the diminished borders of the, of the uh, German uh, post-war um, jurisdiction reporting uh, registering um, loss of significant assets during wartime and asking the rest of society for some form of compensation for uh, those losses. So you had a big constituency of potential recipients of this benefit but also um, unlike some of the wealth taxes that we discussed today you also had a very broad range of paid, uh, payers rather, of, of this tax. Um, so, so the tax threshold uh, was set at um, five thousand. Uh, was yeah, was set at five thousand Deutsche Marks. Um, the the GDP per capita in 1952, when it was introduced, was two thousand Deutsche Marks. So you can see that actually you're going to get quite a few uh, people paying at least some degree of this tax. Um, it was drawn out over a, a very long period. Uh, so over thirty years, there were payments being made on this. So the immediate pain of this to uh, people with post-war wealth was limited, but still um, it raised substantial amounts to fund the post-war recovery in Germany. So we might think of it as, if you like, an alternative. Um, so I think I'm, I'm pretty much at the end of uh, my time. Um, we can think of these political preconditions then. Um, we have the crisis, which has this arbitrary uh, impact on different households, different businesses, and these kind of unusual taxes seek to correct that arbitrary impact in some way. But also we do see in many, many cases there's some 
perceived wrongful enrichment, some perceived profiteering going on. Uh, that adds to the, the popular outrage that these taxes uh, serve to um, satisfy, um, but also to serve to contain as well. But as I said, particularly with that last example uh, from West Germany, um, that's not the only way that tax policy can be configured as a crisis response. So um, yeah, I'm happy, I've got one more slide on the pandemic, but I think that might come up in, uh, in the discussion. So I'm, I'm happy for reasons of time to draw a line there. Okay, Nick, thank you so much. That was really incredibly helpful, very concise, very, very interesting on both historical precedents, but also how this relates now to the current context. May I invite some questions? Um, ben. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I love these sorts of talks that uh, bring up an issue that you think is absolutely brand new and then you suddenly find out that this, you know, wealth tax has been going on for, for years and years. I, I really um, appreciated that. You made a very interesting observation. I think it came in the form of a quote, um, a profits tax, would, uh, when you were talking about a profits tax, uh, a profits tax would do more to increase production than anything else you could do. I found that really interesting because I think in, in, in contrast to a lot of the sorts of things um, that you see that there is this sense that um, it would be economically damaging kind of under, underneath the, the, the sort of undercurrent here. This is a clear sense in which a wealth tax would actually be um, beneficial in, in economic terms actually eliminating a wealth, the classic sort of welfare triangle loss, the welfare loss triangle from monopoly. And I was wondering, you then said a tax on incremental change in wealth or other, sorry, a tax on wealth, where I kind of had the sense you were perhaps talking about property taxes would have the similar sorts of motivation. Is there a parallel motivation, say, on a property tax or, or, or did you not have that in mind? Yes, so, so on, on both um, wealth taxes and the excess profits taxes, there was at the time quite a lot of organising. This actually goes back to John's earlier points about you know, um, seeking some kind of either re empowerment of trade unions or, or replacement, functional replacement for uh, trade unions. Actually, the, the, the um, trade union movement, the Labour Party in the UK, but also trade union movements in other countries were very influential in pushing for uh, these kinds of taxes um, and uh, were uh, channels for articulating that popular discontent. Um, so when, when, when we talk about increasing production, I, I think it's also it's probably worth saying that it's increasing production because if you don't do it, you're, not, you're going to have a strike. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, rather, rather than a, a sort of uh, more more sophisticated based. <laughs> so okay, it's yeah. not that you increase output and lower prices. I mean, the classic. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, 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 it's actually more. Uh, it's more immediate than that. Okay. Um, and and so in that sense, I think um, that kind of argument. Um, really needs a, a sort of strong trade union movement if we're thinking about the political preconditions for them. Um, I think it, in, you're right, and theoretically, it doesn't need that. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but actually, yeah, uh, in, in terms of political preconditions, actually, the, the re-empowerment of some kind of labour representation is very important. Because can I just round out the question? I'm, I'm really interested, you know, I suppose at an economic level, what I worry about a, a, a tax on property is we have a property crisis here in the UK. There's not enough property. So if you then tax the people who are creating property, you make one of the most acute crises we have in the country worse. And so now that quote suggests that there may be some, from a profit standpoint, that there's actually a force that works in the opposite direction. Would that are you saying that argument would carry over to the effects of a property tax? I don't see it, but but you know maybe 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 there is. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting one. I, I, I certainly have to give it more thought. I mean, I think just to pick up your point about property tax and the danger of wealth taxation is deterring the creation property creation property yeah. um, uh, sort of 
buildings. Yeah. I guess the only retail mention was one, but uh, we don't really do much anymore. Um, um, yeah, so the, 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 the creation of sort of buildings that are more residential property yes. in particular. Yes. Um, I think that the, the really nice property, sorry to use the word again, of a, a one off tax on wealth is that theoretically it shouldn't disincentivize that, uh, that kind of activity. It shouldn't disincentivize for right. anything um, because it is. Uh, clearly linked to the crisis, and people people do not expect that they will pay it. They're obviously a bit miffed that they didn't have to pay it, yeah. but it shouldn't actually affect their behaviour. It's the one-off well. aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and you know, the classic example against that is that the argument against that is well, government's done it once, they're going to do it That's again. Right. That's right. Um, but the interesting thing about these things in a crisis context is you don't really see much discussion of that. Um, people tend to accept that there is a crisis. And because there is this clear link to the crisis, mm -hmm. the, 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 the argument that this will be repeated ad nauseum doesn't seem to um, have much of a behavioural effect, uh, as much as you can tell from you know, the lack of data yeah, 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 <laughs> in the immediate yeah, yeah. post-World War II period. Um, the problem with the post-World War I capital levies was that they um, they tended uh, to be pre-announced, and so gave people a bit an opportunity to shift assets and that caused their failure. But um, mm. the actual one off nature of them doesn't appear to have been that widely contested. That's compelling, yes, yes, yeah, fair enough. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, for those two uh, related questions and, and Nick for the answers. One question from our participants, and then we'll move on to the next one. But again, there will be time in the general discussion session to pick up some of the questions that have been raised earlier, uh, but a question to you from Sheila Page is as follows. Does the duration of the crisis matter? The wars gave time for pressure and resentment to build up. Has the pandemic been too short? Now, you haven't quite touched on the pandemic, so we could defer that question to later if you wish, and to talk a bit more about the current context. I also had a question about the current context. You know, is there not the same consensus as there might have been after the war? But if you want to just briefly perhaps respond to Sheila, or, you know, to say that, you know, we're working on it and there will be a response in progress. Um, no, like absolutely. And I, I think that is a really interesting uh, contrast that actually um, not only has discontent not built uh, because of the duration of the crisis, though there is still time. Um, and obviously, um, we're not sure we're over it yet. Um, and you know, two years down the line, we might be having a very different. Uh, conversation, but if the crisis were to continue on a relatively um, on, a, on, a, on a relatively normalising trajectory from here on in, um, then it seems unlikely that you're going to get that kind of popular demand, particularly for the excess profits taxes. It's, it's really interesting to see how inflation has been contained within the crisis um, and how larger companies, in particular, have have tended to tolerate shortages rather than push up prices in the mm -hmm. short term for reputational reasons, no doubt. But actually, when they're all behaving that way, that has uh, some interesting sort of political economic ramifications, or, or, or rather, doesn't have the political economic ramifications mm -hmm. that we saw in, in the war time. So, um, so yeah, um, the duration, I think the duration of the crisis does matter. Yeah. That's a really uh, important point to end. Great, thank you very much, uh, Nick. That was really uh, fantastic. Um, it now um, gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Prasanna Gay, who's Professor of, Eco of Macroeconomics at the University of uh, Auckland, and also currently serving a four-year term on the Advisory Scientific Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board. Uh, the title of uh, Prasanna's uh, talk is Miscoordination, Politics and Populism, and I should also say that Prasanna is joining us from Auckland, New Zealand, where it's now, I think, uh, nearly 11 p.m. So we're very grateful that he stayed up uh, and uh, will uh, present to us uh, right now. Um, and as with all talks, we'll take some questions afterwards. Uh, Prasanna, over to you. And a very good late evening to, to Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Thank you. Great. Um, and um, I hope you can see my screen. I'm trying to share some slides. Um, 
No, we can't see your screen, Prasanna. Right. The slides haven't yet come up. Okay. Um, I... <laughs> How's that? Yes, now we can see them, Great. Sana. Thank you. Um, well, thank you very much, Adrian and Sayantan, for uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present at this uh, workshop. Um, I'd, uh, I very much look forward to learning uh, a great deal more about this whole topic of populism, because I'm very much a, a novice. Um, and uh, somewhat belying the rather nice uh, scenery behind me, there's a raging thunderstorm here. So uh, I apologize in advance if uh, you hear thunder and rain um, in the background. So um, in my talk today, um, I was uh, hoping to just share with you, I guess, a couple of exper experiments that I've been um, dabbling with uh, on this topic of uh, populism and political economy. And as uh, the title suggests, uh, coordination failure is uh, the lens through which I've been um, trying to examine uh, these uh, phenomena. And um, what I'd like to do today is uh, just uh, talk you through very briefly uh, a sketch or two of uh, a couple of pieces of work that I've been doing with some colleagues. And uh, hopefully that will provide some useful food for thought. So um, let me uh, motivate what uh, I'm about to uh, talk about with uh, a couple of quotes, which uh, I think are very well well known to you. Um, you know, um, uh, one from Donald Trump uh, when he uh, uh, felt he hadn't lost the election. Uh, this is a fraud on the American public and an embarrassment to the country. Uh, and he insisted, of course, on uh, on claiming victory, and and we know what happened. Uh, as a consequence. So quite extraordinary behavior really in, in this uh, election, the incumbent refusing to leave, um, and indeed the electoral process as a whole was uh, characterized by all kinds of uh, infidelity, if you like, uh, um, you know, both the most recent American election and the one immediately preceding were dogged by claims of Russian involvement, all kinds of gerrymandering, and of course Donald Trump was very happy to uh, to engage in um, in lawsuits and so forth. So um, there was a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty around the electoral process, if you like, and um, quite a hallmark of, uh, of uh, recent elections. The other quote, of course, is uh, from uh, Mr. Johnson, um, which uh, was uh, just before um, the UK came out of Brexit, I guess. We're getting ready to come out, do or die. Another very famous uh, quote. And um, the interesting question here is what, what on earth makes uh, politicians or policymakers uh, engage or indulge in what are quite large gambles, really? I mean, uh, departing from a well-known and well-understood status quo, uh, leaping into the dark, uh, for want of a better term. And uh, why is it, more interestingly, that voters, um, you know, um, in places like Sunderland, for example, which was one of the... Uh, the the cities that voted along with Brexit, uh, why do they willingly go, go along with these things even though um, these kinds of policy gambles might well ultimately be against their own best interests? Um, and what I'm going to try and hopefully uh, uh, convey today is that uh, coordination failure in a way um, lies at the heart of uh, both of these uh, these issues. So. I guess the, the research questions really are, you know, why do uh, incumbents refuse to depart gracefully? Um, that's uh, the first question. And um, of course, uh, electoral uncertainty, I'm going to argue, is, is a key issue. Um, the second question is this issue of um, discarding the, the well understood uh, status quo and the willingness to gamble. So. Um, just to sort of anticipate what I'm going to talk about, um, there are really uh, two uh, central ideas or results um, in, the, um, in, in what I'm going to say. Uh, the first is that when we have doubts about the fidelity of the electoral process, um, this essentially 
weakens the disciplining role of um, ex post protests by citizens. And of course, um, it's the shadow of protest uh, that one might argue is what uh, creates good ex ante discipline for, for incumbents to behave well. And of course, when we weaken that um, disciplining role, uh, and the mechanism here is through, uh, you know, challenges to the fidelity of the electoral process or electoral process uncertainty, then this creates the environment for incumbents, um, particularly in advanced democracies, to, to tend to outstay their welcome. And um, we have a couple of results that, that show that. Um, the second um, idea uh, really is uh, what, what's sort of lying at the root of this willingness to engage in policy gambles. And uh, the idea here is really a distributional struggle between the elites or capitalists and labor on the one hand, the inability of politicians to commit to a status quo um, on another. And uh, at a third level, the, un the genuine unpredictability of uh, the policy itself, the mapping from a policy to outcomes is, is an unpredictable process. And these three, um, if you like, are the root causes um, that sort of provide the the seeds for, for policy gambles to take place. And um, what we um, have as a result in the, in, in the second model that I'll show you is that voters who would ordinarily like to support the status quo end up rationally voting for, for a gamble, uh, even though it ends up being against their own interests, i.e. Pareto inferior in, in the language of uh, coordination games that uh, many of you would be familiar with. And so ultimately what the gamble really is, is a vehicle for politicians to engage in a redistribution of, of output and that's, uh, or the economic pie. And that's uh, the sort of the central message of, of this second, uh, second piece of, of work. So let me um, just sketch through uh, the two stories um, and then um, just to give you a flavor for uh, what the model or the models look like, and um, so you have some uh, some sense of uh, the logic um, underlying um, these two um, these two claims. Um, I'm not going to, uh, given the nature of the um, the workshop and also the the time, I'm I'm not going to go into the great details in the model. There are papers um, that underpin them, and I'm very happy to share with uh, share those with uh, anyone who's interested. So. Um, the first uh, piece is uh, you know, really about uh, departing gracefully, and this is uh, um, based on joint work with a co-author of mine at, at the University of Auckland, um, Chanel Dooley. Um, and as I've already said, um, there's this tendency that we're, uh, we're witnessing that uh, leaders tend to cling on to their positions following uh, democratic elections. And it's not just the US, you've even... Uh, in the South Pacific, you see uh, quite a few islands, uh, island nations engaging in this kind of behavior and, uh, and so forth. Um, and um, the literature in political science tends to argue that the shadow of ex post protest uh, by, by citizens, the threat of regime change, um, if you like, is really the, the key device to ensure this ex ante good behavior. And the election result, the election itself, plays a, a very important role in this. It's the public signal, if you like, around which the protesters are able to, to coordinate. And if you have precise election results, that facilitates common knowledge and generally gives uh, you know, the impetus for citizens to know what's going on and allows them to coordinate around a protest should they wish to. And so it's the shadow of the protest that ensures uh, the incumbent uh, departs uh, departs gracefully. But what if there is genuine uncertainty about the electoral process? Uh, if there is, if you like, an, um, if you like a, a sense of model uncertainty about the data generating process behind those elections? Uh, well, the answer then is, well, citizens are much less sure about what others are thinking uh, when it comes to lining up um, for, for protest. And so this has a tendency to weaken that ex post disciplining effect that um, I, was, uh, I was talking about. And so 
we have some interesting uh, interesting sort of um, possibilities as a result. And um, what we do in, in our paper is appeal to some recent work by Stephen Morris and Mohamed Yildiz, um, which they dub second generation global games. Uh, some of you in the audience would, would uh, be well familiar with uh, uh, global games popularized by Morris and Shin, but um, of late, uh, Morris and Yildiz have uh, introduced um, another variant. Uh, and here, uh, the key idea here is that the uh, the variable that is the fundamental, if you like, in this case, it's the election itself, um, has a fat tail protest, uh, a process. So the noise has uh, a fat tail process, whereas the private signals that um, citizens receive are thin tailed, um, as is uh, typically the case in, in these regime change games. And what these fat tails do, this model uncertainty, um, does is create strategic uncertainty amongst the citizens when they decide uh, when to, uh, about whether or not they want to protest. And what uh, Morris and Shin, uh, sorry, Morris and Yildiz do is appeal to this argument, idea of a rank belief. Uh, a citizen asks herself where she belongs in the population, um, you know, uh, relative to her peers, and and what's her rank in the in in the in the queue, um, and so. If she's agnostic about it, then any percentile between naught and 100 is equally likely. And so she's going to have something called uniform rank beliefs. And this is what pins down the strategic behavior in, um, in the Morrison Yielders world. And what's quite interesting there is that uh, we lose that unique equilibrium that uh, Morrison Shin um, used to talk about. And the fat tails allow us to, to get um, multiple equilibria in a very a uh, very simple, simple way. And so um, uh, the idea here is that um, if I see a, a, an electoral, uh, or if I receive a private signal about uh, the incumbent, uh, that happens to coincide with um, the election result, then I tend to attribute any difference, any small difference to um, to the, the thin tail component of, uh, uh, of the noise. But if the if my private signal about um, you know, the the sentiments um, of the of the incumbent are, are far apart from the electoral result, then I tend to attribute the difference to uh, the noise in the electoral process, and so it's the that's what causes the uncertainty about my ranking relative to to others because that uncertainty increases. Uh, in the magnitude of, of this difference between the, the thin tail and the, and the fat tail. So just to give you a sense, of, a timeline is always very, very helpful um, to give you a sense of the game. Um, the nature is going to select uh, the incumbent's popularity. Citizens receive their private signals about the incumbent's uh, popularity, so they get some kind of polling result. Everyone observes at the intermediate stage, the election result, um, and the incumbent has a choice. Do I stand down or do I, um, or do I stand firm? If I stand firm, then there's the possibility that the protest gets realized. The incumbent looks at the protest and then has a second go at deciding whether or not to, to step down or, or to stand firm. So this is the, the kind of, uh, of, of model that we, that we have here. And of course, we we solve it um, with the with the usual way. But um, the interesting thing here is that uh, the incumbent is going to anticipate the size of the protest following, um, and then decide whether or not the the, the protest will be large enough to induce uh, a departure. Um, and of course, the the fatter the tail, um, the more likely the uh, the incumbent is going to uh, to stick around rather than uh, concede gracefully. Um, I'm not going to talk greatly about uh, the payoffs, but um, you know, there is a, it's a simple coordination game that characterizes this ex post um, uh, behavior. Uh, the incumbent um, receives a, you know, payoffs if they step down on time uh, of Y, but then there's some kind of cost if they uh, don't step down um, or, uh, at, at all, or if they step down at, the, at their second go. And, and the citizens play a, a fairly standard coordination game, uh, deciding whether or not to uh, 
stay, silent, stay silent or protest, depending on whether or not uh, uh, their beliefs about what others uh, might be doing. And the information structure here is, uh, is the key point. Um, you know, the election result, um, which is a noisy signal of the true popularity of the incumbent, um, follows a fat tail. Um, and of course, the, um, the agents, the citizens receive uh, private signals about, about this public sentiment as well. And it's this uh, election noise that tends to be fat tail, which you know, uh, might be uh, reflecting the kinds of gerrymandering or, um, or hacking type claims that, uh, that is often uh, made um, in, um, in the media. Now, the important, uh, interesting idea in this paper is that um, election results have to be robust. And the idea here is that an electoral rule has to be enforceable and gets followed because ultimately they're going to align with the incumbent's equilibrium response. And so uh, in a way, the idea is to take uh, Morris and Shin and put it on its head. Usually we, uh, as economists, we want a unique equilibrium. But here, multiplicity actually ensures uh, the robustness of, of an electoral rule because um, the problem with a uh, the global game unique equilibrium result is that we're we're talking about a knife edge uh, equilibrium, and so small perturbations in in the environment are going to uh, lead a, uh, an incumbent to um, to not obey a, an electoral rule. So a range of electoral rules, which is given to us by multiplicity, is actually is actually slightly uh, slightly more uh, desirable in in this kind of environment. So. Um, uh, really, um, we can contrast this with, uh, for those of you who, who follow these things, uh, with the so-called first generation games of, of uh, Morris and Shin. Um, this just uh, provides you with a visual illustration. In the center of, the, of that uh, uh, ray is the unique equilibrium of Morris and Shin. Um, the outer bounds in square brackets are um, the common knowledge uh, multiplicity that might emerge um, in, in a standard coordination game, when we have um, fat tails, we have a, a smaller range, but nonetheless a, uh, a range of, of multiplicity um, in, the, in this uh, center um, sort of segment there. And they're the two sort of uh, bounds on the, on the electoral results um, that uh, pin down this uh, strongly enforceable electoral, electoral rule. And uh, this just uh, conveys uh, the same thing in a way. Uh, the election, you can imagine the election result, uh, there's the, the dotted line ER um, on, uh, on the screen there. Um, the incumbent is going to obey the electoral rule if it, it uh, lies between E double star and E star. Um, and um, if that's the electoral rule, then he's going to going to follow it. But notice that uh, there's a positive, it's quite different to the one if you have complete common knowledge about the election results. So once we have model uncertainty, there's a possibility that the, um, that the um, incumbent is going to uh, uh, disobey the, the electoral rule. And, um, and, uh, and why? Because he anticipates that the size of the protest following a decision to stand firm uh, is not going to be large enough to induce him to, to depart. And he knows that citizens are uncertain about each other's sentiment. Um, and so that dampens the, um, the effect of coordination as a, as a, as a protest device. Uh, so the punchline here is that electoral rules in, in democracies mightn't be as strong as uh, a standard model might suggest if you allow for this uh, kind of uh, model uncertainty or electoral, uh, electoral, un electoral process uncertainty, if you like. Um, let me briefly touch on my second uh, point, um, if I if I have a moment. Um, uh, Adrian will, I'm sure, cut me off if I'm if I'm uh, pushing uh, my time limit. Um, here, as I said, um, economic populism uh, comes about because we have an economic pie that is uh, divided between voters and elites. Um, 
the investors are uncertain here about the actions of other investors, and they in turn are uncertain about future policy shifts um, because they they don't know because the government can't commit to a particular policy. You can imagine David Cameron um, and the Conservative Party not being willing to commit to um, you know remaining in the EU, um, and because of that uncertainty, they tend to demand a greater share of of, of the pie, um, and you know, in aggregate this kind of behavior diminishes what the median voter is going to receive from the economic pie. And so the, the median voter in this setup is going to respond to the change in output distribution by voting for a gamble. And so it's this combination of distributional struggle, uh, inability to commit, um, and the unpredictability of the policy that's, uh, that lies at the heart of, of, of a gamble. Um, and this is a, a fairly uh, standard sort of story. We have a two-date world. An incumbent wants uh, capital from uh, from overseas, um, foreign investors, if you like. Investors are risk averse. Um, they would like to be uh, compensated with control over over the domestic output. Um, the voters are the residual claimant, if you like, on um, on that uh, domestic output. Um, and of course, investors can always go elsewhere. Um, there's a, a foreign project that gives them a, um, uh, an outcome with certainty. And the interesting thing here is that the government can influence the background policy, NAFTA or leaving or remaining in the EU. So at the start of the game, there is a status quo policy before the investor uh, invests. But of course, um, what really matters is the election that's going to take place at the at the next period, which involves two parties who are trying to attract the median voter. And so once elected, the party implements the policy platform that it has promised. Uh, parties only care about winning, winning elections. Everyone is risk averse in the story. Um, and uh, we have this uh, interesting uh, issue about um, the inability uh, to commit because the government in the second period is going to honor the commitment uh, to entrepreneurs, but is unable to commit to the background policy, which affects the, uh, the size of the pie. Um, and so um, you have, a, have, have an interesting um, result as, as a consequence. And we can consider the case where the mapping of policies to outcomes is also not perfectly known to, uh, to anybody in the game. Uh, so the true mapping is a, is a realized path of some kind of Brownian motion. And I see Adrian is, is uh, gearing up uh, to, to, to shut me down. Um, so again, we have some, some very interesting uh, re sort of uh, results there. Um, and um, I won't go into the, the details, but uh, you get a very um, a sort of standard result where you have sort of multiplicity uh, emerging. Um, in one equilibrium, investors are going to coordinate around the status quo because they think that everyone else is going to act on the belief that the median voter is, or the median voter is going to choose the status quo. In the other, uh, investors think that other investors are going to expect a policy shift, therefore they demand more. This dilutes the stake available to voters. And now the voter, who typically doesn't like uh, the riskiness of the gamble, nonetheless, is going to vote for the uh, the gamble because he's confronted with a smaller pie, and so he v vindicates these uh, these investor beliefs, and so uh, gambles can be uh, supported by exactly the same fundamentals as those that that support the status quo in this in this story. Um, so, um, just to sum up. Um, you know, uh, models of, of coordination failure, I think, are a useful way of, of thinking about uh, the political economy of populism um, and both uh, political frictions, the fidelity of the electoral process, um, I think, are very important uh, features of, of this story. So let me pause there. I hope I haven't uh, overshot my time too much. Prasanna, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, you you um, got through, I think, a lot, and these are very, very important uh, questions for us to uh, to engage with and think about. So I want to throw it open for questions, uh, and then, um, of course, we'll have 
two more presentations before and more general discussion at the end. Are there immediate questions from uh, from our fellow panelists? Marcus, over to you. Yes, I have a question, uh, Prasanna. Does Model 1 allow for the correlation of private signals that are made possible by social media? That seemed to be the point that um, Ken Binmore was stressing. Typically, these private signals are uncorrelated, but uh, surely they might be correlated if social media are as effective as they seem to be. Um, so you're right, Marcus, um, the model doesn't um, do that. Um, but what one could do is embody some of that, um, uh, if you like, social media component in that sort of electoral fat tail that I was talking about. So you can envisage shifts in what Morris and Yildiz call their rank belief function um, that are sort of driven by shifts in sentiment. So you can imagine some kind of um, dis misinformation campaign by the Russians that creates this, uh, helps create this fat tail and one could shift the rank belief function uh, that way. So we could try and capture um, sort of shifts in sentiment that in that way, but there's no correlation uh, for private signals in the way that um, uh, Ken might be suggesting. If, if you did that, would that would that not constitute a threat to the the Western way of doing things to the social contract? Um, I think it might. Um, I, I'm not sure how I'd do it, but I would uh, I would suspect you're right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus and, and Prasanna for the responses. Any more questions from uh, the panel? I'm just keeping an eye on the chat as well. Um, just to say that I haven't uh, been thrown out of the webinar once or twice. I haven't got all the chat questions right in front of you. Marcus, go ahead. I have a comment, uh, which is that it did seem to be that um, Morris and Shin had this problem in the first round, first generation with the um, rating agencies, which gave sort of public signals about quality and correlated things. And I, mm -hmm. think they were a bit, I think they were a bit uneasy about how that fitted into their story. So I feel there, there are challenges to their, to their um, first generation and possibly second generation model mm -hmm. in terms of these correlating influences. Sure. Um, I, I think the the main point really is is uh, it, it, we're using it as a vehicle to capture this ex post regime change element, um, and it's more I think trying to sort of tell a story about the um, the the, the uh, fidelity of the election itself, which I think is um, it's kind of an interesting one. I mean, um, and so that was where we were coming at. You know, why might the incumbent you know, uh, stick around and, and not depart gracefully, um, even though um, you have, um, you know, um, perfectly, you know, solid rules and institutions that should make you, uh, make you leave. Prasanna, thank you so much. Um, in the discussion, if you're still able to be with us at that point, I realize it's going to be even later, um, you know, we might want to touch on some of the interactions between formal rules and informal norms and how that might also um, alter um, perhaps some of the um, sort of um, policy responses, but also from the institutional and political reforms that might be needed in order to, um, you know, have a more robust uh, response to both grievances, but also populist uh, alternatives to the economic orthodoxy. Uh, thank you again very much uh, indeed for that fascinating thank presentation. Um, I'd now like to uh, introduce um, the next two uh, speakers um, who have co-produced uh, a uh, presentation. Um, uh, Santan Pusha, who's no, um, you know, um, well, who, you know, who, who is co-organizing the workshop and co-editing the special issue, uh, but to introduce him formally, he holds the Adam Smith Chair of Political Economy at the Business School uh, in the University of Glasgow, and is also the Dean of Interdisciplinarity and Impact uh, at the College of Social Science at Glasgow. Uh, like so many others here, uh, he has a long-standing 
association with uh, Cage uh, at Warwick, where he was a research director um, and was a professor at, at, uh, at Warwick previously. Uh, his co-author is uh, Eugenio Proto, who holds the CAN Cross-Chain Applied Economics and Econometrics at the University of Glasgow. Their presentation is entitled Political Coalition's Identity and Rational Populism. Uh, thank you both very much indeed, uh, Santan. Uh, over to you. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, I have to begin by confessing a sense of relief uh, because it seemed very much that when uh, earlier John Kruda spoke and then now when Prasanna spoke, they were going to preempt all the different things that I was going to, or we were going to speak about um, and that they still may have done it, uh, but hopefully, um, you know, we have done it in a slightly different way uh, and had bring, brought in some added value. Um, so um, this, this uh, I, I, so essentially, um, the question um, uh, that we are asking in this paper, but also as part of a broader project, um, goes back to uh, work that we published on the stability of democracy uh, in 2009 in the Journal of Public Economics is the following. Does stable democracy emerge as a solution to intra-elite conflict? And um, um, so now, um, why is this a useful way of looking at uh, the emergence of populism in the West, um, in Western countries? Well, simply because there is a whole mass of work by empirical uh, political scientists, as well as more recent work by Piketty in his uh, book on capital and ideology, but also subsequently narrated anthology on uh, elections in 50 democracies over a long period of time, that um, there are sort of two things that characterize many, many Western economies, which is one is the decline of unions and class-based voting and all types of different associations uh, between, between workers, um, as well as essentially um, uh, a conflict between wealth or wealthy elites, which Piketty calls the merchant elite or uh, the merchant right, um, and essentially uh, educated mainly urban-based or public sector professionals, uh, which Piketty calls the Brahminical left. Um, so the question is, um, and increasingly what we have found is that, you know, these features, these phenomena go hand in hand. That is, elections tend to favor either the merchant right or the Brahminical left. Um, now, this idea of intra-elite conflict um, and the underpinning uh, democracy or stable democracy of some kind is obviously not new uh, in the sense that, um, you know, although this is a pressing problem today in the context of Western democracies, uh, people like Barrington Moore um, uh, in his uh, classic study on the origins of totalitarianism and democracy and fascism, focusing on things that happened in the late 19th century and the first half the 20th century um, essentially talked about a different type of intra-elite conflict, and that's basically the conflict between landed upper class and urban bourgeoisie. And his fundamental point was that a fundamental was that a precondition for stable democracy is a kind of balance of power between the two groups. And totalitarian regimes arise when one class dominates the other. Um, interestingly, um, in a similar vein, uh, Pranab Bardhan, who is an Indian Marxist, uh, the professor at uh, uh, California, he also uh, question, wrote a very, very important book, which he sort of tried to contrast the apparent stability of democracy in India versus the instability of democracy in the neighboring states around India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Pakistan, etc. And in his uh, view, essentially, um, the democracy was a useful um, bargaining tool between uh, different elites. Uh, so again, um, mainly driven by colonial policies, um, intra-elite conflict, at least at the time when Burthen was talking about, was mainly dominated by, uh, say, rural landlords versus urban industrialists, uh, mainly because um, uh, tariff policies basically made that made sure that uh, 
uh, agriculture was uh, favored while uh, urban industrialists faced high tariffs in exporting their goods uh, elsewhere in the British Empire. So there was this conflict between the different types of elites. Now, um, uh, in this paper, uh, old paper of uh, by Eugenio, and by the way, uh, please don't hold, hold Eugenio responsible for anything that I say here, because he hasn't seen the slides. But on the other hand, I do hope that he will join, that he will take handle all the more difficult questions that I'm not able to handle. I, tr I trust you, I take responsibility uh, as well. Um, um, but um, um, anyway, so um, essentially <clears throat> the idea here is that um, you have two elites and these are as a mass of unorganized elite. And uh, basically the power of the elite depends on the asset they own. So, you know, think of a class specific asset. So in the context of the West, we can think of wealthy people who own financial assets, um, um, land, whatever. Um, and then you have, um, and that these generate uh, economic rent uh, surpluses. And then you have essentially the Brahmanical left who would be basically people who are rich in human capital, who have a lot of skills, knowledge, can navigate the knowledge economy, work in the public sector. And there, and the conflict here can be that, you know, the point here is that the elite who all the wealth, well, they don't want to particularly provide public goods because they can retreat behind the veil of their wealth um, to, um, you know, to, uh, to ensure security, whatever. While in some sense, the Brahminical left does depend on, 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 on public goods. And these public goods need to be financed somehow. So there is a question of how does this economic rent that is generated by the surpluses that are generated by the wealth, the assets of the wealthy hold, how can that be appropriated uh, by, the, by, the, by this, by this non-elite, the Brahminical left? Um, and the obvious answer is, you want to try and build a coalition with the non-elite. Um, <clears throat> and you want to write a common story saying that, look, public goods are something that benefit not only us, they benefit everybody in society. So let's form a coalition. In the process of forming a coalition, we can appropriate some of this surplus and then essentially redistribute the surplus between ourselves in such a way that benefits both of us. Um, now, um, it's important that um, to say that obviously the stronger elite also has an incentive to build a surplus with the non-elite, build a coalition with the non-elite to prevent such a coalition between the weaker elite and the, and the, and the non-elite from, from coming up. Um, uh, but uh, uh, there, are, there are constraints. The constraints are fundamentally that, um, you know, uh, the non-elite realize that if they form a coalition with a stronger elite, they can, you know, any promise that the stronger elite makes will not be credible. So they can be appropriated after, um, after such a coalition forms. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there's also an opportunity for the non-elite, for the stronger elite. And this opportunity is basically uh, that uh, the stronger elite may um, set itself up as a, um, um, essentially as the normative reference group for the non-elite. So what do I mean by that? I mean that, uh, so the idea of a normative reference group and the idea that reference groups are very important in understanding behavior, both individually and collectively, goes back to the work of, a plain, of, of many American sociologists, um, 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 uh, starting um, exemplified by the work of Kemper in 1968 and more recently in 2016. And the idea here is that a person's behavior, uh, beliefs, uh, preferences are to a very large extent molded by uh, the reference group that they have in mind uh, uh, when, when, they, when, they, when, they, when they make choices. And if the stronger elite are somehow able to position themselves as the natural reference group, as a normative reference group for the non-elite, then they can use this to prevent a, a collision between the, the weaker elite and this, and this non-elite forming. Um, one obvious thing that the non-elite can do, and this is rooted, uh, one obvious thing that the stronger elite can do, and this is rooted uh, 
very much in the history of the nation state itself as it has evolved in Europe and, and, in, and in parts of North America is basically to say that, you know, we are the same. And the reason we are the same is because we share a fixed identity. The fixed identity can be whiteness, it can be a shared history, um, it can be a shared history of wars, it can be patriotism, um, it can be many, many different things. Um, um, more recently in India and in Brazil, you see um, an, an evocation of um, Hindutva in India um, and a kind of mobilization of the evangelical Christian uh, base in Brazil by Bolsonaro and by the BJP in India. But essentially what I would say here is that in both cases, as in, as in the UK uh, with the conservative party and the attempts by Trump and the Republicans in the US by the National Front in, um, but also to some extent by Macron and others in France, what we are seeing here is the positioning of these groups um, of the elite, the wealthy elite, as um, um, making themselves a kind of normative reference group for the non-elite. Now, uh, what this does is that it changes the payoffs of the non-elite from forming a coalition uh, with the weaker of the two elites. So uh, what do I mean by that? Well, suppose um, the non-elite anticipate that by forming um, a coalition with the non-elite, um, they can get a payoff, which is F, and the fraction of that payoff, uh, and in order to access that payoff, uh, they have to essentially uh, become a member of a party. Um, uh, otherwise, they cannot access that payoff. Um, uh, and so if there are, if a fraction pi of the non-elite are a member of the party, then by becoming a member of the party, you get pi F of that payoff by forming a coalition with the weaker of the two elites. And in some sense, one minus pi B then becomes the psychological or identity-based loss that arises because you're acting, you're doing something that is against the, um, that, that is against the reference point set by this reference group, the normative reference group. And uh, the cost of that depends on the number of uh, people, uh, the, the, the number of other non-elite who choose uh, who choose to do something different from what you are planning to do. So if you're a party member, you get pi F, but non-party members, uh, but the fact that you have one minus pi non-party members uh, means that you also, you, you get this cost, this identity-based cost. And then of course, there is a cost, an individual cost to collective action, and that's just C. So that's just the material cost, the time you give up, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, if you don't get into this, perhaps you get some fraction of what has been a bargain. So that fraction we call epsilon, but you can set epsilon equal to zero. So now the point here is that you get a game between the non-elite, which is essentially a, a game which is essentially has two equilibria, and this is where I think the similarity with Prasanna was particularly worrying for me, not for him, but obviously for me. Um, uh, and I was wondering, you know, what was I going to say, which was going to be very different. Well, the point here is that the equilibrium selection argument that one can use is different. And it's not the one that is suggested by global games, but essentially is one that relies on the idea of risk dominance. Uh, so the idea here is that, you know, the non-elite will uh, coordinate on what is risk dominant. Um, now, uh, to explain the idea of risk dominance intuitively, um, it's a game theory concept, but intuitively, um, go back to Rousseau's parable of the stag hare uh, hunting game. So essentially, um, you know, uh, you have a group of hunters, each hunter on their own can hunt a hare, uh, but they need to come together to hunt a stag. Um, now, obviously, um, the share, the per capita share in terms of meat from hunting the stag successfully is higher than what they would get by hunting a hare on their own. But of course, the point here is that hunting a hare is risk dominant because it doesn't really depend on what the people are going to do. But hunting a stag, even though it is Pareto efficient, is actually <clears throat> um, is, is, uh, is, is more risky because you know, a small deviation 
by a group of, suppose, you know, you show up to hunt the stag and not everyone else shows up, but a fraction show up, um, then essentially the probability that you will successfully hunt the stag goes down. Um, and in this context, we can adapt um, uh, the idea of a stochastically stable equilibrium, um, stochastic stability due to H. Peyton Young into an equilibrium selection argument and demonstrate that in this setup, essentially you always pick the risk dominant equilibrium. So the salience of identity based politics as against class based politics depends very much on which form of behavior is risk dominant um, in, this, in this particular context. And the key uh, threshold value here is this, is this ratio C plus B divided by F plus B and whether that is bigger or smaller than half. So what does this mean? So C remember is the cost, the actual physical cost of acting collectively. B is your identity based loss. F is your gain from um, uh, aligned with the non-elite and then you have a plus B. And the observe this, this ratio is increasing in B. That's pretty straightforward to check. And so what this essentially means, and this can be perhaps explained through this diagram here on the uh, X axis, I have F on the Y axis, I have C and B. And essentially uh, it is all values of C, B and F that are below the F by two line here. That's when acting according to your class interests, material payoffs becomes risk dominant. And above that value, um, uh, it is uh, identity-based politics becomes, becomes risk dominant. Um, and observe that essentially the lower F is, the higher B is, the lower, the, the bigger C is. In all these, that combination means that identity-based politics becomes salient. And, 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 and risk dominant. And on the other hand, the higher the F is, the lower the B is, uh, the lower the C is, in those cases, um, in sense, you know, traditional class-based politics becomes, becomes salient. So essentially, uh, we get three types of equilibria, basically. So one is uh, incorporating this, um, this type of, um, um, risk dominant selection argument uh, into the into the into the into the model, we get essentially one in which you have oligarchy. So, uh, you know the 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 stronger elite prevents the coalition between the non elite and the and the and the weaker elite and the weaker elite from forming, and in this case, the stronger elite is able to appropriate the entire surplus. So this is essentially because the non elite uh, just coordinate on the risk dominant outcome where identity becomes salient, but also uh, where identity becomes salient um, and in a sense, seem to vote against their own material interest, which they are doing yeah, in a way, because they're still Pareto dominant to form the coalition with, from their perspective, to form the coalition with, with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with the weaker of the two elites. Uh, democracy is a situation where you have a more balanced surplus allocation. So the idea here is that now the non-elite organize to act collectively together with the weaker elite. They form a coalition with the weaker of the two elites against the stronger elite. And then in this way, they ensure a more balanced surplus proposal and a more balanced, uh, more, more, um, more, more, more balanced uh, surplus sharing proposal. Populism is a bit like oligarchy or fascism uh, in that you don't, uh, you know, you could, um, so the difference between populism and fascism, you can think of it as fascism is about increasing the value of C. So you ban the formation of political groups, et cetera. You outlaw communists, you shoot people who protest against you. Populism, if you wish, is increasing the value of B. You kind of go back to patriotism, you emphasize whiteness, whatever any difference between the non-elite and the weaker of the two elites that makes it more costly for the non-elite to form a coalition with them and makes identity more salient. So just to give you two examples of what we mean here. So Bardhan in his book uh, talks about, here is a example of, a, uh, of, of how the non-elite, the weaker of the two non-elites may mobilize the the uh, the non-elite against the stronger elite. Uh, 
So if industrialists at any over time overstep in their bargaining, sure enough, there will be an uproar in the parliament about the anti-people conspiracy of monopoly capitalists. And then you will have similar invectives against the kulaks, so somewhat less frequently against the parasitic intelligentsia. And the idea then here is that this type of, of arguments is all about um, the competitive politics of democracy, which essentially keeps rival partners um, uh, within the elite on the defensive. On the other hand, as Kemper notes, and this is the importance of normative reference groups, and I don't think we have fully understood and modeled and thought through the implications of that within economics. So status, power, and ritual interaction identify status and power as the twin forces that structure social relations, determine emotions, and link individuals to reference group that deliver culture, administer preferences, actions, beliefs, and ideas. And especially important contention is that alliance to ideas, even though it's fundamental as the belief that one plus one is equal to two, is primarily faithfulness to the reference groups that foster the ideas rather than the ideas themselves. So this is the power of a normative reference group. Um, it changes, in a sense, the way in which people see the world, what beliefs matter, which beliefs are salient, which are not, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I now want to give a couple of examples, and I want to situate the right-wing populism in the, in, the, in the West in the context of these examples, just to demonstrate that, look, the, the issue of intra-elite conflict leading to democracy depends very much on this coalition, on this pattern of political coalition formation, which in turn depends on the non-elite solving a dilemma, which is you know, whether these type of identity-based things become salient as against class interest-based based, based issues. Um, so in India, you know, the classic example was uh, Indira Gandhi's attempt to mount a coup by imposing emergency in 1975. And of course, this culminated in her losing the enormous popular support she had had to enjoy it. And even though she promised more redistribution to the non-elite, this commitment was not credible because the non-elite correctly anticipated that you know, they may be appropriated by her if they form a coalition with her. And so instead, what you had was an alliance consisting of the non-elite and anti-Congress parties fiercely oppose opposing her and organizing large mobilization. And then she lost the subsequent election and democracy, or at least uh, aspects of democracy in India were restored. Um, in France, in 1848, uh, you had universal male suffrage when a social reform agenda was passed, thanks to the alliance between the working class and Republicans, a conservative government came to power and disenfranchised 2.8 million men in 1850. However, in 1851, the working class supported the coup led by Bonaparte, who restored universal suffrage, um, <clears throat> um, uh, initially formally, and then later on more, um, uh, more, uh, more, more, more substantially. Um, and again, you see that this type of class dynamics or coalition formation dynamics that I'm talking about uh, works itself out in that particular historical episode. Um, to come back to the issues of identity-based politics and rational populism, so if you think of the current uh, working class in high-income societies today, they're highly atomized. They don't have the uh, either the ability or in many cases the willingness to mobilize in any significant political organization or party. So remember, the point about the salience of identity. So identity becomes salient when you're not able to mobilize collectively as, as the non-elite. That's really when identity becomes salient. And in a sense, what you have is you have a, this Brahminical left that Piketty talks about, who are this other section of the elite or as viewed as the other section of the elite. Um, and uh, essentially, um, 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 uh, the you know, traditional social democrat parties, labor here, but elsewhere as well, are seen now as representing the interests of those of that section of the elite. Um, and you can think of that elite as the Brahminical left, in a sense, as really you know, setting in place uh, the usual type of exclusionary uh, devices and cultural ideologies that justify their own dominant position. Uh, using the language of wokeness, blah, 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 intergenerational conflict in the same way that the wealthy have always done. 
you know, uh, uh, you know, justify to justify, um, you know, what are clearly economic rents as the basis of reward to risk taking behavior, blah, blah, blah. So there is this kind of competing rhetoric uh, between the two groups, but this is really rhetoric to, ju to justify their own class positions. Um, and uh, so, but what you have and what is I think interesting here is that the wealthy have figured out a way of becoming part of the normative reference group for the non-elite in Western societies. And they have figured this way and the, what they have done is essentially they have used um, the um, uh, idea of patriotism, whiteness, nationhood, et cetera, et cetera, so that those become the normative reference points for the working class um, as against a, you know, as against a more kind of universalist um, uh, socialist agenda, which was the attempt by uh, by by uh, by Labour Party and by other social democratic parties, certainly uh, towards the turn of the last century or the end of the nineteenth century. Just to, I, I want to go back to this point because I think that's it's it's a, it's a very important point. So what you see is you see that you know the Working Men's International, the Communist International, these were deliberate attempts uh, by working class uh, organizations to set up a link between working classes in different countries. So the working class within a country was never viewed as an isolation. It was viewed as part of a larger working class within an international context. Now, unfortunately, many of the social democrat parties, uh, for example, most famously by voting with their national governments to, uh, uh, to wage World War I, um, um, uh, and where essentially you had members of the working classes in each of those different countries killing each other to um, uh, basically uh, push the interests of their elites um, um, and in, in, in one way or the other. Um, so, you know, you had, you had this historical compromise of the left and social democrat parties whereby you reinforced national identity and membership of this national club um, as the root as a way to get some sort of a welfare state, um, agreed to by the elites, by the wealthy elites in their, in, their, in their own countries. But in the process, you shift the normative reference points for the non-elite in these countries. And it is a very difficult thing to shift. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to change in practice. So therefore, you know, all this talk about managed immigration and so on, while you might expect a truly social democrat party to, for example, try and have a general strike along an international supply line. So why not have zero hour contract workers in the West and garment workers in Bangladesh coming together and organizing a general strike along an international supply line? And in this way, you change both the normative reference group, but you also change in some sense, the share of the pie that you're getting, the F, because the F that you're getting is limited uh, if you act within national boundaries, is limited by the fact that you are acting within national boundaries. Um, and so, you know, you can think of the new labor as an attempt to build such a coalition between the Brahminical left and the new and the non-elite by trying to increase F, but not successfully doing so. Um, and now what you find is that, you know, so you have similar types of things happening elsewhere in the world. So in Brazil, in India, again, you have this attempt to shift what is the normative? What are the normative reference points for the non-elite in these countries um, by the wealthy elites uh, to prevent a true working class um, coalition forming, uh, which would then essentially expropriate the wealth of the elite um, to uh, uh, for the for the for the purposes of the non-elite. And just to give you a cautionary tale in terms of where this type of a logic can end up, we only need to look at a number of different so-called failed states in different parts of the world. Of course, the history behind these failed states are complex. They're a product of colonization, et cetera, et cetera. But if we just think of, uh, think of Nigeria as a very good example, you know, essentially, you know, there were three different ethnic organizations. So again, ethnicity um, becomes the salient identity um, in, in, this, in, this, in this type of situation. 
Um, and you know what you have is you have these ethnicity was linked to regional divides, and then you know this this led to party formation along ethnic lines, uh, etc. So what I'm trying to say here is that you know there is a complex underplay between economics, between the changing political economy of the, the changing economic structure reflected through F, uh, the um, uh, the making it more costly for the working class to uh, form coalitions changing, reflecting through C, and uh, the rise of identity-based politics reflected through changes in B, and the three can come together to make identity more salient, and therefore populism emerging uh, in, these, in, these, in these type of settings. I'll stop here. Sanson, thank you so much. Um, that was incredibly rich, and of course, my thanks go equally to Virginia. Uh, are there questions from panelists or participants? Ben, as a panel first. Yeah, uh, fantastic uh, presentation, Sayantan. I found the ideas that you were talking about of coalition formation very compelling. Um, what I what it called to mind as I was listening to your uh, to your presentation. There's a brilliant book that you may be aware of already, but should take another look at if you um, if it slipped off your radar screen. And it's by uh, Rogowski, Ron Rogowski. And uh, it's called Commerce and Coalitions. Mm -hmm. And it's just um, example after example going right back to the Romans and coming right forward to the modern day of how different uh, groups had formed coalitions to very much in the way that you've described, but he um, he's very, he's vague, but he doesn't have a model. It's, it's all a conceptual discussion of all the exact sorts of, sorts of, uh, um, sort of coalition formation between uh, different groups in society. Now he, his discussion is, is usually shaped around the workers on the one hand and how they form coalitions with one elite or the other and his underlying sort of economic mo motivation is around the Stolper Samuelson theorem and scarcity uh, scarcity of, of factor ownership relative scarcity of factor ownership but he's completely he doesn't have a model um, of any of the sorts of stories that he tells and yet so it seems to me that you have a model uh, of how, how and why these uh, different um, uh, groups decide to form as coalitions and the political structure that emerges as a result. So, uh, so I think you might get a lot of, of um, kind of the examples there that you can actually sort of provide a, a, a concrete motivation. Yeah. No, thanks, thanks for that. I mean, I, I kind of... Um... Um, um, I kind of, um, I think I, 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 I agree with you. I mean, I've read that book actually recently. I mean, um, so I'm, 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 I'm aware of it. And I think um, Eugene and I see this very much as a first step in a broader research program. Uh, by the way, I haven't talked about, you know, the point about the non-elite themselves being fractured, um, you know, um, um, and uh, so that that kind of kind of complicates the the coordination problem, uh, and this is really a static framework. I think it's a dynamic one, so there are all types of different things that one can one can one can one can bring into the picture. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's I think you know I think this is a very um, you know uh, when I was an undergraduate in India, you know I was the Maoist, so <laughs> so this is my my homage. To my to my undergraduate self, um, you know, um, uh, Marx uh, and class and class conflict and class collisions uh, come back into the picture in a, in a very big yes. way. It's fantastic. Sorry, right, thank you. just uh, can I add some couple of things, uh, or oh, maybe maybe yeah. better somebody else from the floor uh, if there is no question from the floor. Well, there there is one actually. Okay. So may I? Read out the question and then maybe you respond to that, uh, make some other comments, and then I think we should move on so that we can wrap up by 1.30, if that's okay. Yeah, question... actually, it's it's my 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 intervention. It's it's a bit related to the question of uh, uh, Keshab. Okay, let me just read out just in case people don't have access to the chat. Um, 
The Prime Minister of India, uh, Modi, comes from the working class. Elites could not stop him gaining massive support. Democracy by its structure minimized the influence of elites in the distribution of economic surplus. In the meantime, it also does not really promote dynamics through innovation and technology, which forces of capitalism do. Therefore, for development, even popular leaders need to take a, a route of capitalism. Conflict continues how to reconcile. So, Eugenio, on that and any other brief reflections, and then we'll move on. Yeah, I think that at the end, the, the elite miscalculate um, how much uh, this uh, populism uh, uh, can, uh, can, can come back, can get, can return on their own pockets, in a sense. Uh, if you think about both Mussolini and Hitler, effectively they're, they come from working class or uh, small, small bourgeoisie. And uh, they have been welcomed by the rich industrialists uh, at the beginning, but then at the end they realized that uh, it was not a great, a great uh, bargain for them, and they tried to liquidate them, but it was too late. Um, you can get a glimpse of this with Trump and Murdoch. Maybe you, uh, Murdoch at the end realized that. Trump was, was, was taking him toward some very unknown and at the end he tried to take distance from it. So in a sense, I think this, uh, uh, this process uh, that uh, Sayant and so nicely uh, outlined is, is not a great deal for the, uh, uh, for the strong elite from right-wing elite. Uh, they, they tend to uh, miscalculate that and, you know, that's more or less my answer, yeah. I mean, to that point, I can just add that, you know, there is a very strong and a very good efficiency wage argument for provision of public goods and the appropriation of surplus from the wealthy for the provision of public goods, because essentially, you know, in a, in a model of growth, the point is that the future surpluses may well depend on the amount of public goods that are provided today. And so there is necessity to appropriate some of that surplus, but the question is, what is the political mechanism for doing so? And that is really the formation of this coalition between the non-elite and the weaker of the two elites. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, I think that, that's an Eugenia's point, I think we're both really crucial uh, because again, the contemporary uh, example suggests that that's one of the you know, the main um, dynamics to look at. Thank you very much indeed. Santa, may I hand over to you now and then I will start sharing my screen if that's okay. So let me just start my presentation um, again by thanking you all uh, for being here, uh, Sam, and thank you so much for everything you've done to make this possible. And to say that I um, will try and touch on a few things, uh, not for too long, because I now stand between you discussion and the end. So, uh, and of course lunch, which uh, is probably the least best position, uh, the, the worst position I should really say to be in, but I'm, Delighted that we've had this workshop here this morning. It's been fascinating. I really look forward to all the papers and the special issue. We'll say more about that at the end. But let me just make a start uh, by saying that I want to come back to some of the fundamental questions of what is populism, how to think about it in relation to technocracy, and then uh, talk briefly about some policy uh, proposals. So the standard definitions uh, in economics often tend to focus on policy. So we have the one that you have all, I'm sure, come across. That, you know, populism is often described as an approach to economics that emphasizes growth and income redistribution and de-emphasizes the risks of inflation and deficit finance, external constraints, and the reaction of economic agents to aggressive non-market policies. This is the Dornbusch-Edwards definition that has been picked up again a lot in recent uh, times. So this focus on policy and where policy uh, goes wrong and how populism tries to correct it. And then standard definitions in political science tend to make the point that this is really all about ideology, okay? So, uh, Kasmuda and 
um, the co-author say it's basically thin-centered ideology that divides society into two homogenous and antagonistic groups: the pure people and the corrupt elite. So, in other words, populism is anti-elite and anti-plural. Again, that has been widely referenced in uh, recent uh, years. Now, whilst I don't want to dismiss both definitions entirely, or indeed the thinking behind that, I don't think that that goes far enough. I do think we are making uh, or running the risk of making some uh, mistakes here, which is not least to do with the fundamental separation of economics from political science. And so I would want to argue for a more political economy conception of what populism is and isn't and how to respond to it. So let's rethink populism briefly. Well, first of all, I think we can uh, agree, both in terms of history and the contemporary context, that populism is often a method for electoral campaigns, and indeed, of course, for governing as well. So it is the case that populism can be interpreted as both being manipulation of the electorate, right? And that's never been the monopoly of anti-elite insurgents, right? That's also been practiced by elites at different times. I mean, you know, we could uh, mention Margaret Thatcher and some of her populist messages. We could mention Tony Blair's, whether it's, you know, education, 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 or, you know, tough on crime, tough on the causes on crime. Populism as a method uh, is not the preserve of an anti-elite uh, insurgency. And I think Peter Mann's work and Colin Crouch and others have demonstrated this. I mean, think of how, you know, Berlusconi governments not just campaigned, okay? And I think that uh, would be an example of when uh, uh, an incumbent uh, certainly adopts uh, populism and sort of sets a new, um, I think, new terms for debate. But also, I think we can make the point that sometimes populism uh, might mean political movements that have mass support right, for ideas of which the incumbent liberal needs to disapprove. So is it really all bad? Can we really just say, oh, it's a threat to liberal democracy to the market economy? Or may there be a correction? But perhaps the incumbent liberal elites, technocratic elites, often have not addressed some real grievances. And that's not to say that all grievances are real and that the way that they're talked about the populace is necessarily the only way. But I think we can't just dismiss it as a pure threat. So a more integrated understanding of populism would say that, yes, uh, the insurgents portray themselves as anti-elite, but often they are as elite as the establishments. We're really talking about an intra-elite conflict that has already been mentioned. I mean, it's really difficult to say that Berlusconi was an outsider or Trump was an outsider or, you know, or virtually any of the other ones. There might be some exceptions, um, you know, some Latin American exceptions, perhaps, some on the far left who've not really held power. But often it's not the case that these are complete uh, outsiders at all. And also the overlap of economic with cultural economic issues with cultural values, I think, is important here. I'm just sort of highlighting this point around, for instance, work. Work is, of course, about income, of course, about material uh, well-being, but it's also about self-esteem, recognition, right? So even the very question of work already suggests that we can't completely separate economic and cultural issues. They're not identical, and we can distinguish them, but I don't think we can separate them in our analysis or indeed in the policy prescriptions that might follow. So what would a political economy conception of populism have to uh, reflect on? Well, first of all, is it really, is really all populism anti elite I've just referred to it. Up to a point, of course, it is about the incumbent elites, but it's also about new leaders and new leadership and alternative elites, right? And that, of course, again, we can see with, for instance, uh, elements of, you know, Brexit and Trump, the recent Podemos, and quite possibly the SNP. Right, which billed itself as the great outsider, but has now been in power for, I think it's 14 years counting, since 2007, right? And still somehow adopts the, the discourse of sort of, you know, outsider and insurgent, but actually having been the new elite for quite some time. So I think those tensions here we need to reflect on. Is all populism anti-plural? Uh, often it is. Often it wants to, you know, replace corrupt elites as it sees them with pure leaders or rather you know, leaders who can finally represent the pure people. However, is it the case that all liberalism and all technocracy is always pro and upholds pluralism? And again, I think the work of uh, people like David Markins shows that even liberalism can slide into an anti-pluralist uh, position, whereby it essentially just wants to see certain state and market forces and wants to essentially sideline a lot of the intermediary institutions 
that would really provide real plurality in public debate. Right? So the point that actually convergence of state and market is not really fostered participation and a plurality of interests right? that often liberal elites have been associated with vested interests. Again, some of this has been touched upon already by Santon just now and by Prasanna earlier as well, I think. And populism is frequently a backlash against the prevailing political and economic orthodoxy for reasons uh, that have also been mentioned. But I want to stress that it is not just a threat. It may also serve as a corrective or at least highlighting issues that simply have not been addressed. And one of them is really, you know, populism as a reaction to the perception and indeed we could say the reality of powerlessness of certain groups in public debates, including policy debates, whether it's certain workers, whether it's certain other sections, right? vocational training, you know, all sorts of interests and groups we can think about that have not been fully represented. And therefore, uh, this sense of powerlessness often leads to initially anger, but also then a, an electoral backlash we've seen, uh, you know, play into uh, Brexit, Trump and many other elections over the last 10, 15 years. And of course, in times of profound accelerating change, simplistic messages often resonate much more than a carefully crafted, more technocratic arguments, and they're amplified by digital medias. You know, Guriev and Kabanayu in their uh, survey have, have clearly shown. So on populism and technocracy briefly then, yes, in many ways they are polar opposites, but could we perhaps also make the point that paradoxically, they can reinforce each other. Why? Because they can point to each other as the enemy, right? and therefore essentially legitimate their own claims by saying, look, if it's not us, it's the populists in power, or if it's not the populists, you know, we need to revert to technocracy to safeguard liberal democracy. So therefore, there may be this binary of play here, which perhaps crowds out alternatives to both. And that's really where, where I'm heading with this. So, We've heard a lot about elites, again, it's been mentioned this morning. One interesting way of putting it was just done by uh, the political uh, theorist Jan Werner Müller in his most recent book, Democracy Rules, where he talks about the double secession, right, which is eroding democracy from within. Wealthy elites are insulating themselves from ordinary people who in turn often don't go and end up disengaging from politics altogether. And when they re-engage, after years and decades of disengagement, they would not vote for uh, more established parties, they would most likely vote for the populist uh, insurgency. Now, this is not really a new idea, though I think Muller puts it very clearly and, and cites lots of evidence and support. Christopher Lash, in his book, 1996, right, portrayal um, of, uh, uh, you know, the great sort of portrayal of democracy, uh, role of the elites in the portrayal of democracy, he makes the really important point that this growing insularity really means, amongst other things, and I quote, that political ideologies lose touch with the concerns of ordinary citizens. So can we really say that social democracy, conservatism and liberalism in the last 20, 30 years have always reflected the concerns of ordinary citizens? I think there's enough evidence to suggest that they haven't. They've often moved away. You know, we've already mentioned immigration, but there will be a whole sort of other things, you know, uh, precarious work, lack of housing, health, education, but also questions of belonging like that play into immigration, but also loss of communal life locally, you know, the high street that changes beyond recognition. You know, there's a long, long list of issues we could mention here. As a result, Lash contends, this is now 25 years ago, the new class has a thin sense of obligation. It's retained many of the vices of aristocracy without its virtues, right? lacking a sense of reciprocal obligation between the favoured few and the multitude. Interesting that he uses this language, because of course that's now occurred with left populism, right? Michael Lind, uh, not Michael Lind, uh, uh, Negri, right? Hart and Negri, Michael Negri and, and Hart, you know, Hart and Negri who talk about the multitude, right? But also, um, and it's been mentioned already, neo feudalism uh, in the context of China. Joel Kotkin, who I mentioned earlier, <coughs> makes the point that America is also now moving into this neo feudal direction, right? Silicon Valley, Wall Street, right? We could see where this might go uh, if nothing changes. So then is there a convergence or even fusion between populism and technocracy? I don't think we can dismiss that possibility out of hand. On the contrary, we've seen how certain political movements or actors, five-star movement, right, uh, with Beppo Grillo, or even France's La République en Marche, headed by Macron, 
do combine sort of both technocratic and populist appeals. They use technology, they're very modern, right? they want to smash the existing political establishment, as they indeed have done in some elections, right? and sort of claim that really they're the leaders who can you know, enlighten the people and lead them sort of towards you know, uh, endless uh, perpetual progress. And often, interestingly, they do appeal to expertise at some moment. So you might have Michael Gove from the Brexit Group saying, we've had enough of experts. Right? And then uh, a few years later, he's part of a government that says, well, we're following the science on the pandemic. You know, don't you see how this is all data driven? You know, I think we have to here really accept that perhaps there's something like a techno populism at work. And this is the term used by Bickerton and in their recent uh, book. Now, some policy examples here, just to um, foreground this briefly, you know, bailout of banks without reform of the financial sector, you might say was on one level populist, because what it meant is that you save the financial system from collapse, but you don't really touch the kind of vested interest, meaning initially you do something which you say to the people, you know, it's great progress, you know, we saved you from the Great Depression, right, which happened in 2932, not this time, but actually what you're not really tackling are the root causes. Okay? And again, QE as the purchases and so on, again, is that sort of monetary activism that just keeps the ship afloat. We told it's wonderful because we now have historically low interest rates, isn't that great for all the people? And yet, you know, what does it hide? Actually, inflation and how it benefits certain interests. Fiscal stimulus, again, we're saying, oh, isn't it wonderful? No mass unemployment with this incredible shock that we've suffered. And yet, you know, who really benefits from further? Yes, the workers do up to a point, but what happens later on? Right, in terms of the transition and also the, who pays back the debt, you know, that sort of plays into all those debates around redistribution <coughs> assets we've already touched on. Surveillance capitalism, right? We talked about all this infinite choice and isn't it great? We've got all these technology platforms now, but what about tax, right? Uh, what about the endless monetizing of our data and ultimately the invasion of our privacy, right? And what that might mean for well being going forward. So there's all sorts of issues. Here, I think, where we can point to some connections between populism and technocracy. Two key questions, I think. Has populism been caused by faltering living standards over recent decades, not least in the context of post-financial crisis austerity or fiscal consolidation, as some uh, still call it? Uh, or has political polarization contributed to falling prosperity? There isn't a consensus. We don't move together forward as a country, right? Or perhaps both at once. So there might be some interesting dynamics here to think through. And secondly, can populism be conceptualized as an almost natural democratic challenge to the state? In other words, something that will occur periodically. We've seen it in the 19th century, we've seen it in the interwar period, there were some examples in the 70s and 80s already. Right? Is this just something that happens? And that either succeeds or fails by the quality of the response by the state and by elites and the political establishment. Now, briefly on politics and policy. So how can we perhaps better understand populism? Well, I think we have to challenge the dichotomy between economic and social cultural drivers. We need a more holistic approach, recognizing all the interdependencies. It's partly been done by people like Eichenbrief and others, but really we do need to think very hard about how do we combine economics, culture, geography, demography, and social class. These issues don't go away. Class is perhaps the big unspoken thing in recent years, and yet, as Piketty and others have shown, uh, you know, class never really goes away, though, of course, it morphs and mutates. And then also analyzing historically when populism can drive positive economic change, you might say Bismarck's reforms were partly a form of populism, right? The Great Reform Act, the New Deal, perhaps, but also, of course, when it leads to negative outcomes, you know, the clamp down on, on fundamental freedoms, right, on constitutional separation of powers, uh, and also policies that really only benefit certain groups. But the idea that populism is all good and all bad is clearly far too binary and simplistic. So, drawing on insights from research on, I think, political business cycles will be interesting, how economic and political cycles are not at all aligned, and that creates all sorts of frictions, but also on the importance of institution building. We've already seen this with the narrow corridor, right? this idea that actually the fundamental institutions are the thing that might stop a country from sliding you know, into autocracy or even dictatorship, never mind new forms of tyranny, perhaps linked also to technology. But then we also need to focus on the consequences of developments such as Berlin national debt and how that's being 
uh, dealt with central banking decisions on low interest rates, I've mentioned fiscal choices, right? That then drive certain conditions, real wages, right? Living standards, barrier access to credit, growing wealth disparities, and so on. But let me just go through some of them very, very briefly. I think there is now a lot of evidence to suggest that the rise of newly industrialized countries as key trading nations, of course, China above all, but also others, has contributed to real wage growth. It's not the only cause, and there could have been other responses, but I think that's a dynamic we are clearly facing. <laughs> and perhaps also then with the loss of jobs or lower wages, a sense of community exclusion. Then the shift in global savings and investment trends, clearly low, result in low equilibrium real interest rates, supported by expansionary monetary policy, and that and in turn again leads to asset inflation and all the wealth disparities we've touched on. Uh, what about younger workers, right? whose real income is rising only very slowly, perhaps now a bit more in the wake of the pandemic, but let's see how that goes. That may just be a temporary phenomenon. Uh, everything John Cranus said around, you know, will there be labour, you know, employment bills and so on to really get to the grips with precarious uh, employment? That is, uh, remains to be seen. Though Joe Biden seems to be tackling this, but again, we'll have to see how far that programme goes as well. So this is a challenge both for the right and for the left in power. Political disengagement, right, falling voter turnout on the whole, I mean, refer the referendum are probably an exception, but in general elections, turnout has tended to decline. Party membership, again, some exceptions, but on the whole is down, and of course, growing political polarization. Um, right, we need to recognize there's also the interdependence in these things, but also the inter intergenerational inequality that's growing, right, in terms of the baby boomers who've done exceptionally well and the next two generations that aren't doing nearly as well. But also, there are differences between age corporates, of course, but the main underlying force is still a secular trend of disengagement on the whole, if you look at it over, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Two new dimensions, social media, but also perhaps a widening gap in knowledge, because knowledge has become incredibly technical in many respects, right? And the general public that has been disengaged has perhaps not uh, you know, felt able to contribute. Though, of course, overall standards of education are going up on the whole, uh, at least in formal terms, we can then debate about the quality of that, but nevertheless, still the question is, do the public today feel less engaged than perhaps 20, 30 years ago? There's no national conversation the way there might have been then. Whether there was a good or a bad thing, it's also to be debated, but I think the sense of fragmentation is very clear. And then, of course, that really feeds into a discourse uh, promoted by populists about supposedly self-serving elites versus voting the will of the people. So all, for all these reasons, populism is clearly uh, still thriving even after the defeat of Trump um, and other, some other changes. On social status and cultural values, you know, I do think the economic dimension of this is very clear. Right? Slow wage growth over a long period, up until now, zero hours, flexible contracts, and unemployment, or underemployment among certain groups, clearly alienated many working people and affected the meaning of work and self-esteem. And then the growing gulf, you know, we've got various uh, measures now that are very clearly showing how the UK is one of the, you know, most spatially disparate countries in the whole of the advanced economic world. You know, all the OECD countries, you know, it, it basically scores incredibly high in terms of spatial uh, disparities of both wealth and power. And this is not so much cities versus, you know, towns and the countryside, the coastal areas, or just London and the southeast versus the rest of these two things are, are true. We also have to look at the inter-regional disparities. So within the southeast, which is a massive area, as you all know, uh, of course, there are such incredible differences. Or let's reduce it even to London. I mean, the idea that London is all you know, wealthy, metropolitan, cosmopolitan, I mean, it's obviously a nonsense. Uh, even within areas of London, the inequalities are extreme. Take Kensington, right? There's a royal palace, there are lots of mansions, it's probably the single wealthiest part of the UK, and yet you have Grenfell Tower, right? And so the aggregate picture will never really tell us very much at all until you look at a much more grander level. And then we get notions like the geography of discontent, right? Philip McCann and his uh, work, or indeed the revenge of the places that don't matter, right? And that, I think, is part of the appeal of populism, whether it's right-wing populism, 
with, say, Brexit or Trump, or indeed maybe driving some of the Corbyn vote in 2017, which was a form of left wing populism. Right, we're going to nationalize this, that, and the other. And clearly, that seemed to be garnering some support uh, in that election. So, policy ideas, just to uh, mention briefly improving access to finance for businesses, because that's still a problem. Firm creation is very much concentrated in London and the Southeast, or parts thereof. Right. And so regional and sectoral banks would be one way, perhaps, to spread firm creation, which would then lead to more employment uh, elsewhere um, and also help the recovery. Maybe a national investment bank uh, in the UK and all levels of the four nations. Scotland already has one. But do we also need to drive that well beyond infrastructure? I mean, the infrastructure bank is one thing. But, you know, what sits in down between 14 and 22 billion? Is that really going to tackle for the whole of the UK? I wonder. Reskilling, clearly, whether it's higher education or further education, there needs to be more vocational technical training. We see that the labor shortage is now, but also generally to say to people, yes, if you want to go to university, that is your interest or your talent or vocation, absolutely, you must find a way to go. But likewise, if you don't have academic interests, why are we telling people still that this is the only path to success, right? That plays into the debates about meritocracy, and this idea there's only one model of success, right? You have to go to university, ideally, you've done finance or law. So you can go and work in the city, right? That's the sort of thing we've been saying, right, more or less, for uh, uh, you know, a generation. Then create, creating technology trusts and science hubs to share the R&D much more, because R&D generation in the UK is very good, leading among OECD countries, but perhaps only certain firms benefit. And there's a long tail of firms that don't absorb the benefits of R&D. So that is perhaps one way of sharing that a bit more. And there could also be a public-private dimension there. Regional and local government in terms of knowledge, in terms of proximity, accountability is vital. And I think fiscal federalism for the UK and indeed new fiscal frameworks have put the emphasis far more on inclusive growth, on measures of prosperity and living standards that are much more than about GDP, so that we can actually talk about shared prosperity in a meaningful way and not reduce it just to per capita income, which has been overall a very perfect measure. So very briefly then to conclude, uh, first of all, I think it's important to say that technocracy and populism are not just diametric opposites. They might be on policy, but there's also uh, the possibility that they fuel each other. And that perhaps we end up with something which is not actually that democratic or not that prosperous. And that I think is the challenge to, for us to, uh, to think through. I think a real alternative would be to build and extend democracy, which is not reducible to technocracy or populism, far from it, and also to consider great economic democracy, right? more democratic workplaces, much more representation of workers in the economy uh, as one way of both raising income and also esteem. And then clearly this is not merely about uh, policies. Yes, policies can help to address grievances, uh, but institutional political reforms are also vitally needed. And it's the balance of institutional, political, and policy reforms, rather than seeing you know, any one of them as panaceas that I think we'll need to consider too. Let me leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. Science and over to you. I think you're on mute if I don't. I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, I just wanted to look at the chat to see if there are any questions. Um, does the panel have any questions to begin with? And then we can go to the, yes, please. Um, thank you very much, Adrian. I, I have to congratulate you for being the only uh, person among us that actually really started by discussing a definition of populism I you know I, I realize I sort of dimly aware that we should have done that and then I thought everyone else should have done that so congratulations for actually doing that um and and so I'd like to I'd like to press you on how you're thinking about populism from your discussion I almost felt that you were using the words populism populist and popular interchangeably. So I wondered if you'd ever recognize a situation in politics and political economy that was popular 
but not populist and vice versa? Yeah. Well, that, that's a really good uh, question, Ben. Um, a difficult one as well. So I suppose the difference would be where there's generally popular support for certain things that you know isn't just uh, a very short-term thing but actually sustainable because I guess that would mean looking at you know social attitudes looking at long-term patterns of voter preference and so on and then working out what are popular policies that populists may occasionally promote in which case we'd have to acknowledge that what they're doing is popular not just populist but of course on lots of other things uh, not at all. So two, two examples I think are, are interesting here. So one, in the US context, clearly a majority seem to recognize that certain infrastructure investments have not been done for very long. And you know, whoever proposes them will get their support. Trump spoke the language of big infrastructure things, you know, the biggest infrastructure deal, what are we talking, a trillion or so, you know, at the beginning of the presidency, never did anything about it, right? Joe Biden is trying, it gets support, it goes through Congress, right? Same with healthcare before that. These things, I think, are popular. Of course, it depends a bit on how they're done. And not the final outcome may not be as popular, but there's a clear popular design and need for it. I think the, the example that clearly isn't uh, popular at all would be certain tax cuts. You know, so Trump speaks the language of the people versus the corrupt elite. What does he do? A major tax cuts for the ultra-rich. Right? That would never command any support, right? not in this time and not 20 or 30 years ago. So I think that, that, you know, that's an interesting example. I think in this country, industrial policy has a lot of support. People recognize that deindustrialization, you know, with havoc in so many communities. And when Boris Johnson goes to Scotland and says, Margaret Thatcher was the first to think about climate change because she closed her mind, well, I'm not sure how that's going down. But I can't imagine that that quite captures the mood there or indeed elsewhere. And, you know, the same about Tony Blair. I mean, yes, it's wonderful to open up uh, university education to everyone, absolutely. But is a target of 50% a really popular thing to do? I'm not sure. I'm not sure people think in terms of you know, such targets. I mean, that to me seems to be much more aimed at, you know, this is where we're going with the whole economy, as you know, John Carlos commented earlier, uh, and we just want to go for this target because for us, there'll be a sign of progress. I don't detect great popularity in that. And then if you add to that all the reforms, including the student fees, you do wonder whether this was really a, a you know a popular thing to do or not, I, I, I would mention. So I think there is that difference of you know what is what are issues of long-term popular support right, that we can point to, and then issues where populists simply do things because it either suits them uh, from a point of view of vested interest, Trump, and you know getting some support among uh, you know not as wealthy Republicans, but but it's sort of what I've said it the oligarchy more generally, uh, or indeed way to study ideology. You know, I mean, you know, again, how would you target on, on immigration are a good example. You know, we're going to bring immigration down to whatever level. It, that, that's not what it, it is in itself popular. What people want to see some action, some coherence about how this is going to be done. But people aren't going to be saying closed borders or open borders. You know, neither commands a popular majority because people know intuitively and when they think about it, that neither is an answer, and we need to have a longer-term, you know, strategy. So I think that might be one way to respond, but it's not a neat definition. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question. Sorry, yeah, please, please. You, you, you had a question. Yeah. 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 Okay. So thanks very much. That was a really, really uh, fascinating presentation. Um, I'd just like to question on this. Definition of populism as a critique of prevailing uh, economic and political orthodoxy. Um, populism is not anti technocratic, but perhaps a conflict between the existing technocracy and the technocracy that wants to emerge. It made me think a lot about the literature and policy paradigms. And, and actually, maybe what we're witnessing here is the sort of downfall of one policy paradigm. Um, which creates space for alternatives, some of which uh, we could describe all those alternatives as populist. They're all, they're all outside the status quo, but you know, maybe some of them are objectionable and we only want to describe the objectionable ones as populist. You know, that's more a rhetorical question, I guess, for, for, for politicians rather than a definitional question for academics and how we, how we want to do that. But it, it strikes me that the policy paradigm uh, perhaps failing to deliver might be quite key here. And it's, you know, you mentioned Thatcher, you mentioned Blair, you sort of 
you, you could argue Thatcher certainly is a change of policy paradigm. You could certainly argue, some people have said recently, um, you know, Blair constitutes with the rise of the knowledge economy, a, an attempt to actually answer some of those, those um, economic issues. Maybe it worked for a while, maybe it's now unraveling now, uh, maybe it never worked and we were just uh, sort of uh, deluded by debt finance, finance consumption that it was working, but uh, you, you can say that either way. But, but that certainly that policy paradigm literature seems to map on quite nicely to the, the kind of lines that you want to draw here. Yeah, th thank you, Nick. I think that's absolutely right. Um, and what's interesting is I think whenever there's been a paradigm change in policy terms, it's often been underpinned by, you know, a fairly coherent, you know, political position. So, you know, Attlee uh, and the, the Attlee government as a whole, you know, drew on decades of work on Keynes, on Beveridge, on many others, to try and put forward their vision for, you know, post-war reconstruction and recovery. And the policies often could be mapped quite closely onto that political position and body of work. With Thatcher, there was certainly coherence. You know, Hayek, Friedman and other influences very clearly saying it's not working because the state and the unions aren't working and here's the market-based model we are now going to uh, promote. Now, that didn't necessarily mean a huge shrinking of the state. I mean, Ronald Reagan spoke the language rolling back the, you know, from the state and yet the weight of the state and the economy didn't change that dramatically. You know, it's basically been since the end of World War II around the 40% mark, you know, plus or minus sometimes closer to 35, sometimes a bit above 40. But, you know, there has not been such a sea change. World War I was the change when it went from 10 to 40 percent. And it's never, you know, and obviously during the war, in World War II much more. But, you know, in, in peace times, it's not really changed dramatically. But then the question is, how does the state work, you know, in the interest of what and so on? So I think then we have to look at the structure of the state, you know, not just ownership, but also how public services run and so on. I think what curious about Blair, Cameron, and perhaps now the Johnson government, I'm leaving out Brown because it's, it wasn't that different from, you know, from a new, new Labour, of course, is that they've all tried to reset it or even perhaps bring about a new settlement, but it hasn't been on the same par as either Atlee or Thatcher. So we're still in this sort of interregnum where, you know, the post-war settlement clearly at some point came to an end and was largely replaced, not wholly, but largely replaced by the Thatcher settlement, the Thatcher settlement has been in crisis for various reasons, economic, political, cultural, and yet it hasn't been fully replaced by a new settlement. I think Blair attempted it, I'm not sure he quite got there. Cameron again, now this government. But, you know, until you've got an alignment of a coherent body of ideas, a political position and a policy offer, that more systemic change, I think, is much rarer. Again, Trump looked like the biggest disruption, maybe was for a number of years, but did it leave behind a new settlement in American politics? I think that's harder to argue. It certainly has met, meant huge changes for the Republican Party and hence for kind of a partisan political debate. But has the fundamental US settlement changed? I don't think so. You know, Wall Street, Silicon Valley, the issues around deindustrialization, the Rust Belt, I mean, they're, they're still with us. You know, just like certain issues bequeathed to us by the Thatcher government are still with us. So I think that's the difference. But yes, policy paradigms, you're absolutely right. They play a huge role. Because that gives a sense, I think, of how coherent it often might be. And whether it's essentially reformism, which I think is what Blair was, trying to reform the Thatcher settlement by not changing it, or whether it's actually a transformation of the settlement or even a more revolutionary replacement of one system by another. And we've seen very little by way of revolution or transformation. We've seen much more reformism. The question is, is reformism going to be enough to tackle the grievances, the ones that are real, not the more imagine that. I think that might be one Okay, so thank you very much for that. Uh, Adrian, that was a fantastic uh, and a very interesting talk and a and very interesting question answer session. I just wanted to now, you know, we, Bernard has been asking a lot of questions on the chat and he hasn't had, haven't had an opportunity. And I guess this is a question to all the panel, really. So Bernard talks about what does taking care of those left behind actually mean? And how do you make it more precise to follow Kudas? And um, um, you had Hector Calvo related to John's intervention and Bernard Case's question, for democracy to work, the left behind need to find a voice. Who represents better the left behind today? 
So perhaps maybe Adrian, you can start and then maybe a chance for other panelists to chip in. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Bernard, for all your questions and comments on the chat and indeed some others we haven't been able to touch on. We have saved them though. So we've got a, a, uh, you know, a, a written version as it were. Um, so we will certainly reflect on them and maybe get back to individual uh, participants or certainly um, include them in our next iteration of these, of these papers. Uh, but on the question of, you know, who's best um, uh, sort of addressing the, the concerns of the, the left behind, well, I think the first point to make is that it's quite a disparate group. I don't think we can really talk about a monolithic group of the left behind. Because the left behind could be either some of the younger, more urban, you know, citizens and voters, uh, and we've heard about some of the issues there in terms of work and housing. It could be some of, you know, the, the, all the pensioners who are actually living in poverty because they don't have the sort of pension that sustains anything like a stable life. It could be, you know, what we used to call the, the squeezed middle in the years of Ed Miliband, you might remember, or the just about managing, the jams, which, you know, Theresa May's preferred um, description. You know, so who are we talking about when we talk about the left behind? I think we have to be a lot more specific. And then I think the point at the moment, there isn't yet a coherent policy offer to address the different concerns. There also isn't really a stable electoral coalition who represents them. Because whilst we've seen a realignment in terms of, uh, you know, a section of the working class vote here with the Johnson 2019 landslide victory, it's not the case that, that somehow this is now created a stable coalition and that, you know, the policies of this government are clearly listen up to a point, yes. Uh, maybe even with the social care initiative, though, I'm not sure that that really addresses that particular coalition. You know, it's trying to essentially please a number of voters by saying we're doing this, and it's not just the workers are paying, we're also taxing shareholders and, you know, let's see how this goes. Um, but I don't think we can point to one government or one set of policy responses that where we could say, you know what, they've really grasped the nettle and they've addressed the concerns of the so-called left behind. Um, it's a bit like each settlement, I think it'll take a lot longer for something to emerge that really deals with those concerns. It's not going to be one or two policies by, you know, a government that's in power for just a few years. Okay. Does any other panelist want to chip in with uh, any views anywhere on? I'll pick up on that. I, I really like, Adrian, the way you, you said, you know, we need to address the question of who are the left behind. Um, and I think they are. Uh, and, and then if, if we're going to be broad about this, then we have to talk about the institutional environment. We have so that the, the traditional uh, view about the institutional environment from a sort of what I might call a classical liberal standpoint, which is kind of where we're coming from with our paper, is that people have to have the opportunity to, um, to find their own way, whether that's to get the education that they need to pursue the careers that they want, to undertake the investments that they want to undertake if they're going to be starting a business. And I think even just focusing on those two basic principles, um, the question then has to be, why are these groups being left behind? And even, just to be a, a bit polemical about it for a moment, are they really being left behind? Mm -hmm. If you actually look around, you know, when I look, when I look at various different aspects of standard of living, I think people at the bottom of the income distribution have much greater credit uh, than they had, uh, you know, even thinking about when I was a child, you know, people uh, on fairly modest means can now get access to buy cars, to own mobile phones, to have access to technology and so on, um, uh, that just didn't exist before. So I, I, I think the right question in, in, in asking this is to first ask, you know, are the traditional methods of addressing uh, uh, that we thought were there to address the left behind um, more of a problem than they were in the past? Are people unable to access credit? Are they unable to access education? Um, are they a unable to access asset markets? I'm actually, if I'm honest, a bit skeptical that, that it is more difficult for any given person to access those things than they were at the beginning of my lifetime 50 years ago. 
So I'd want you to show me exactly the sense in which these people really are left behind. And then on a case by case basis, go through, you know, okay, what are the problems? You know, and it, it brings it back to the conventional question of, you know, show me the externality and then I'll show you the policy response. And I want to see the externality and then I'll give you the, the policy response. Anyone else from the panel to uh, answer this question? So I, I, can I just take a minute to sort of to put forward my views on this? So, I mean, I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with the work of um, um, Boan Yonov, Yonovic, I forget pronouncing his name wrong, but fundamentally, you know, this point about citizenship rents, I don't know whether you, whether you know the concept. The concept is basically that if you correct for, um, for skill and then you control for other factors, uh, you know, do people with the same level of skill, what are the kind of different real wages they get? Again, you're talking about real wages and not nominal ones. And you find that consistently in the West, you know, citizens, uh, there is a consistent citizenship rent. Um, you can actually extend the concept further. You can talk about a locational rent. You can talk about a class rent. An obvious example of a class rent is what we saw before, which was this point that, you know, the rate of return on wealth depends on how much wealth you have. Um, so there are various examples of these types of rents that we are talking about. And my point, and I guess by left behind, we mean people who, for whatever reason, are unable to, are the lowest in the pecking order in terms of accessing those rents. And the traditional ideas behind uh, social democracy, or social democratic parties, has always been that you know these differences which can be put down to rents should be gotten rid of uh, because that's not only economically inefficient uh, uh, because for example you know a, all wealth should have the same marginal return and shouldn't depend on how much wealth you have so that's just not a, just that's, that's not economically inefficient but it's fundamentally unfair. And I think it's really going back to this idea of building a coalition of um, such people and building a coalition and uh, sort of, um, um, you know, with other groups who resist this, this, this way of, uh, of distributing rent that we, that, you know, that would be in my view a way forward. And I suspect it can't be done within national boundaries anymore. I think we have reached the end. Of, of social democratic politics, which is confined to a national boundary. And this is the end of the road as far as that is concerned. I think we need to go beyond that. We need to build coalitions between the left behind all across the globe. And then collectively take on the elite globally to appropriate a larger share of the surpluses and rents that have accrued to them. I don't think this, the, the, the end of this, the logical end of this national, working within national boundaries is in my view, right-wing populism. Well, I mean, that I think would open up a, you know, a really fascinating debate and one that I hope we can um, address at least in part in, you know, in the special issue when we come to you know, writing up the presentations and then and then publishing that. But I think that is a fascinating question around coalition building and also critical mass, right, in terms of political representation and agency. Um, of course, there will be questions around, you know, how does that work with national social contracts and democracy? But I think that that would be, I think, one of those questions. As the economy and capital have gone global, yeah. you know, can other mechanisms do something similar to be accountability enforced or not. But, you know, the question of rents, whether at the national or global level, the question that, you know, Ben raised about, you know, what exactly are people facing and is it just worse across the board? Are there certain aspects of it that are worse and others that are better? I mean, surely access to credit isn't just generally worse than, you know, 40, 50 years ago. It would depend on which group and geographic you were and so on. But yeah, I think both the kind of complexity and nuance, but also the, 
you know, some of the global forces and dynamics here in terms of capital flows and so on. Fascinating question. Should we draw this to a close? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit conscious of time. Um, I mean, people have been incredibly patient and resilient. We started just after 9.30. It is now nearly 2 o'clock. Um, and it's just been great to see the level of, of engagement. Huge thanks to our participants who have been very active on the chat. And as I said, we have saved it. And so we will reflect on this and we will try and go back to you with some of the questions. Um, the special issue is going to be prepared. We're going to be communicating to everyone about this. Um, we're scheduling a sort of um, a winter publication, which probably means something like February, March of 2022. So there's a bit of time, but not too much time, and we will be in touch with the speakers around around that schedule. But we're really, um, I think, thrilled. I mean, if I may speak briefly on Santan's and my behalf, thrilled with the presentations, really great level of discussion this morning and this afternoon. And uh, I think something which, uh, you know, is of enduring importance, you know, populism never went away, isn't going to go away in the future. Uh, and whether it's a good or bad thing, it needs to be fully, you know, analyzed, understood. And I think some of the policy proposals we've also heard about will be fascinating to explore more. So a really huge thanks to everyone. But Santin, can I ask you to close the workshop formally? No, thank you very much, Adrian. So thank you so much for, um, to both the panelists, the speakers, as well as the uh, participants, um, who were um, you know for their questions, for their for their involvement, um, for the excellent quality of the presentation, the excellent quality of the questions. Uh, thank you for taking the time to participate in this. And as Adrian said, we will all be the both of us will be in touch about the special issue and about the papers and the timing and so on. But hopefully, you know, this is only the first of. Uh, several such occasions when we can fundamentally rethink some of these issues and questions that go to the heart of building a fairer, more just, more participatory uh, economy, society, and policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to Thank the audience. Thank you very much.